Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. That when I talk about it in public, I often, <coughs> excuse me, get the most hateful reaction from white people. So <laughs> wow. everybody, everybody understands, of course, that the, the condition of slavery, as you just pointed it out, is is the absence of consent. Nobody consents to be a slave. So when when we ask, you know, do slaves consent to go work in the fields? Well, of course not. That's the nature of slavery. And that's true across the board. It's not just about work. It's about any interaction with a master. Therefore, any sexual contact between a master and a slave is essentially a case of rape. Now, most people would agree with that. And we talk, actually, in, in our history classes about how the white plantation owner would go into the slave quarters and rape women who were in uh, that condition of slavery. But... Even though we'll say that in kind of a general way, that's very difficult for some people to recognize when it's applied to a specific white person, especially a revered white figure like Thomas Jefferson. So here's Thomas Jefferson, who's the author of the Declaration of Independence and our third president and, you know, this much revered figure. Somebody people have a lot of respect for, a lot invested in their ideas about Thomas Jefferson. Yet, it's undoubtedly true that now, because of the DNA evidence and other forms of evidence, that we know that Thomas Jefferson had sexual relations with Sally Hemings, a woman he owned. That means, by definition, Thomas Jefferson raped Sally Hemings. So, now, even though the logic of that is, I think, beyond question, as you just pointed out, because Thomas Jefferson is such a a heroic figure in American history for white people. White people often simply cannot accept that. So they'll talk about how he and Sally had a loving relationship and, and all of these attempts to gloss over the fact that, in fact, Thomas Jefferson owned her. And that when she was, you know, submitted relationships with him, it was in that conditions of master and slave. Um, I don't know exactly why, but there's something about Thomas Jefferson and his status that, that when you make that claim, it, it drives white people crazy. <laughs> that's not to say, that's not to say that, I mean, I don't know anything, obviously, about the psychology of Ellie Henning. I, you know, haven't been able to talk to her, obviously. So I can't speak to how that relationship looked to her, nor can any of us, obviously because, of course, she's long dead. So we don't know how she experienced this, but we do know the, the, the legal status that she had in relationship to Thomas Jefferson at the time. And therefore, I think to say that Thomas Jefferson, right, Sally Hemings, is a perfectly, it's historically accurate, it's um, logical, as you pointed out, but that doesn't mean people, you know, like to hear it. I mean, we cannot be saying this guy is a raping... I mean, we'd be calling him Dominic Strauss-Kahn. <laughs> well, there's a lot in common there, isn't there? The Cows, Justice, Gus T. Renegade, in for another broadcast. Hopefully to share constructive information on the system of racism white supremacy uh, today's date Thursday February 28th 2013 so I have been told we will be back tomorrow six study session Melba Patillo Beals Warriors Don't Cry Back to the regular uh, broadcast time. I know last week I had to had things to do. Was trying to go out and excited to see 
Douglas Blackman, author of uh, Slavery by Another Name. Uh, he was visiting our neck of the woods, so I wanted to get out and see that. So I know we were a couple, we were about an hour and a half early last week, but we will be back to the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, Friday, tomorrow evening, afternoon, uh, regular broadcast time. You can tune in. Looking forward, we are a little bit more than halfway through the book. I think we should have three, maybe four more sessions before we uh, complete the book, but very much looking forward to hearing more about how uh, things unfold in uh, Arkansas, 1957, Little Rock Nine. Tune in tomorrow. Again, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Pacific. Looking forward to the study session, sixth installment. Uh, the sound clip that you heard at the beginning of the broadcast, that was Dr. Robert Jensen. He is a professor at the University of Texas, Austin. He is the author of The Heart of Whiteness. Uh, he's been on the broadcast three times. Uh, that segment was from his visit in May of 2011. Uh, we spent quite a quite a bit of the broadcast uh, or I won't say quite a bit but we spent a significant amount of time talking about Thomas Jefferson he has a specific section in his book uh, where he goes into more detail about what you heard in that sound clip that uh, slaves obviously do not consent to being slaves therefore anything that happens after the enslavement they don't consent to that either uh, be it picking cotton cooking supper being raped by a slave owner including Thomas Jefferson that they cannot consent to any of that so any sort of sexual intercourse that occurs after someone has been enslaved is automatically by default rape I think very lucid if it doesn't make sense you can dial in and let us know but I think it very very lucid very obvious uh, he points it out like I said he talks about this in his book the heart of whiteness we talked about it on his visit and uh, I thought very important that uh, he pointed out that when he discusses this in lectures and what have you that white people seem to have a big problem with this point uh, he talked about how people have got up and stormed out of his lectures and got an attitude with him and that sort of thing uh, most revealing I think as we were saying in the clip uh, I think white people have a lot invested in the legacy of Thomas Jefferson I think white people have also had quite a bit to say about our guest for today's broadcast uh, and his book on Thomas Jefferson. I uh, found it one of our uh, listeners, Code Lens, victim of racism, doing constructive work. Uh, he wrote a review uh, about the book we are going to discuss today uh, and pointing out that there has been quite a bit of controversy going back and forth. Uh, people have praised the book. People have complained about the book. Um, will be interesting to get more detail from the author and to get some of his thoughts. I know Annette Gordon-Reed, black female, great scholar, she uh, has also been pretty critical uh, of the book as well. It will be great to, to get some of his thoughts on what people have had to say about the book and to go more in detail about what exactly he had to say about third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, our guest for today's program, he is an independent scholar, journalist. Uh, he's written several texts, uh, including an imperfect God, George Washington, his slaves, and the creation of America. Uh, he also wrote the Harris, the, excuse me, the Hairstons, an American family in black and white. Uh, the book we will be discussing today, his 2012 publication, Master of the Mountain, Thomas Jefferson and His Slaves. Uh, he's been on book TV. He was featured. Uh, in the Smithsonian Magazine. Uh, he's been on MSNBC. Lots of attention for his book. Real pleasure to have him on the broadcast today. Joining us live, uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, my alma mater, University of Virginia. Uh, our guest for today's broadcast, Mr. Henry Winsick. Uh, Mr. Winsick, are you with us, sir? Yes, I am. Thank you, Gus, for having me on. Pleasure is ours, sir. Glad to have opportunity to uh, to discuss your controversial work. Um, for listeners, this might be their first time uh, hearing about you. Uh, if there's any background information, anything that you think listeners should know about you before we proceed with the discussion, that would be great to kind of start with. Uh, well, I think um, some of the important background is that, that 
my book on Jefferson turned out to be the third book I wrote about slavery. I hadn't intended to write three books about slavery, but it just uh, sort of happened that way. Um, the George Washington book was an outgrowth of the book on the, the Hairstons because my Hairstons research sort of took me back to the revolutionary era, and I couldn't understand why we could keep slavery when, you know, the, when, when the United States had fought a war for universal liberty and so many African Americans had fought in that war. Uh, and that led me into writing about Washington. Uh, and then when I was giving a talk to a group of librarians about my Washington book in Richmond, Virginia, in the Q&A, one of them said, you should do a book on Jefferson. And I hadn't thought of it before, even though I, I can see Jefferson's house from the end of my street uh, in the wintertime when the leaves are down. Um, and I, I thought that was, a, it, that was a great idea because there was so much about Jefferson that I didn't understand. Um, and I, I, I sort of got the feeling that I had been avoiding thinking about him too much, maybe because I was you know, living, living so close to his house. Um, and you know, the, 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 the more deeply I got into the subject, the more puzzled I was. And I began finding things in the records that really overturned all the ideas about him and about slavery that I had started out with. Uh, and the, so as one result, the book took a lot longer to write than I expected, and the book turned out to be, a, I think, a, a darker image of Jefferson than I had expected. Fascinating use of those terms. I think, uh, I think the way that they titled it, and this is not, I'm, I, I suppose Mr. Winsek did not have anything to do with this, but if you check for the interview that he The title did, of the book? No, sir. The title of the segment when you were a guest on uh, MSNBC and I think Teray was uh, hosting the program, I think they, they titled it uh, The Dark Legacy of Thomas Jefferson, uh, the use of that term. And I know you, you use that term dark in the book quite a few times. I encourage listeners to pay attention uh, to the use of words, particularly when color metaphors are used, dark and light. Pay attention to that. Uh, I think it, it reveals quite a bit. Um, I guess before we go forward, you are a white man, is that correct? Yes, yes, I am. Right on. As far as I know, uh, one of the, one of my uncles um, said to me bef uh, a number of years ago. He said, uh, "Well, you know, we have African ancestry," and I thought, and, and he, my, my my father's family is from Poland, so I thought this is completely impossible. And he he said, "Well, your great grandmother, your great grandmother's." maiden name was Morgian, which is Polish for a, a Moor or a Negro. And I said, that's not possible. And he said, well, that's what it means. So uh, if, if you go far enough back, uh, I, I may have had some African blood in my background. I've never, ever been able to research it, but it's an interesting possibility. Wow, fascinating. Uh, reminding me, uh, Fiddler on Pantico Roof, that should be coming next week. Uh, Mr. Joe Mazingo has a very similar story. Uh, stay tuned. Um, before we get... I read that book. It's a, it's a fantastic book. I, I got it in my bag right here. Joe Mazingo, stay tuned. You got a recommendation from our guest, even. Uh, this broadcast, The Cows, Context of White Supremacy, uh, I have unfortunately concluded that the uh, unifying thread between your book, Mr. Mazingo's book, Dr. Robert Jensen. Unfortunately, we are in a global system of racism, white supremacy. I use those two terms as synonyms. I use the same definition for both terms. Uh, the definition I use for both racism and white supremacy is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you believe that such a system exists and do you think that's an accurate definition? Well, I think if you look through uh, world history, you'll f you find many, many examples of it. And I think that Jefferson is a very good example of the fear that uh, that white people, especially northern European white people, have had uh, toward black people. Uh, and but if you also look at Jefferson, you, that you, you see 
uh, an example of a white man who sees the financial opportunities of 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 a of a an economic system which holds black people in in complete subjugation and turns them into objects of money or turns them literally into money uh and th that was one of the things that really disturbed me about my research in the Jefferson papers is that it became clear that Jefferson realized the the fantastic financial possibilities when you could buy and sell people when you could mortgage them when you had, when you owned a community of black people that was reproducing itself at a predictable rate, and when the market was, when the market for black people was rising as in his uh, in his estimation, at five to ten percent a year in value, that this was an inexhaustible source of of capital assets, uh, and this is really an aspect of Jefferson's slaveholding that. Scholars have avoided because it's 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 ugly and it's also humiliating. I mean, white people don't want to say these things in front of African Americans, um, and yet, you know, black people have always known this, uh, but white people don't want to you know don't don't want to talk about it. Uh, but that was really the underpinning of the slave system, and Jefferson reveals it more clearly than than anybody else. Hmm. I know. Uh, I do th uh, just want to make sure that I have clarity. Uh, I'm not I am not uh, restricting when I say the system of racism, white supremacy. It's not restricted to activities of slaveholders in the 18th or 19th century. What I'm uh, what I'm stating is that this system is still rolling today. Uh, February 28, 2013, white people dominating, subjugating everyone whom they classify as not white, that that, this, that system uh, is what was happening during the era of Thomas Jefferson and that that system is still in place today. Uh, do you believe that that is the case and the definition that I gave, do you think that that's accurate? If you don't agree, that's fine too, but I just want to want to be clear before we move forward. No, uh, well, you know, it's, it, it is a completely different system uh, because back in the 18th and 19th century, we had we in this, you know, we, America, had a legal owner, you know, the, the legal right to own black people. So that has certainly changed. Uh, I mean, is, do we certainly still have, have, have racism today, uh, but we, you know, we don't, we don't have the same system of ownership that we had until 1865. Uh, but as Douglas Blackman has demonstrated, that the slave system you know, extended well into the twentieth into the twentieth century, and it was slavery by another name. Uh, and when I when I wrote the Hairston's book, uh, it struck me that that life for African Americans after slavery was, in many respects, harder than it was during slavery. Because it's it's one thing to be a slave during slavery time, but it's a you know another to be a slave when you're supposed to be free, and yet you don't have any opportunities. Uh, uh, and you know you can't vote, you can't go to school, you run the risk of being ha hanged for starting a business or being too successful, uh, or you run the risk of being beaten up if you're a teacher. Uh, that that's the sort of thing that black people faced, you know, in 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 freedom time. Um, and the situation today, I, I you know I would argue that it's that it's it's better. I mean, it's certainly better than it was under legal segregation. But certainly, uh, you know, racism still exists. There's no question about it. Okay. I see it. I I see the the racism coming out whenever there is an article in a newspaper or a magazine, even about a any, any kind of African American history item, uh, and then you get a long trail of comments. You know, why do the you know these people still complain about slavery? It's over. Uh, you know, they, you know, they're always portraying themselves as victims. They're always looking for handa. And what strikes me about that is the incredible hostility towards black people that still exists among many whites today. They, they, they won't even. Many whites can't even stand to hear the simplest thing about black history without going crazy with anger and hostility. I would totally agree. Uh, I think Black History Month is a great time that evidences that. Uh, before I want to get to the book, uh, and I actually want to get your, your thoughts about the clip with Robert Jensen at first, uh, and I'm hoping for the broadcast we can 
cover as much material as possible so if you can share it as much honesty as you can stand if you don't agree if you don't think the system of racism white supremacy still exists that's fine but I'm not I, I feel like I still am not clear as to whether or not I've got an answer uh, I'm not saying that the system has not changed evolved refined uh, since the time of Thomas Jefferson but what I am saying the fundamental core that was present then and now with regards to white people dominating everyone that they say that is not white in all areas of people activity uh, that that fundamental principle is still in effect uh, guiding the system that we live in worldwide racism white supremacy uh, do you think that that is true uh, if you don't that's fine but I just I think that's very important to to be clear about our stance on that so do you think that that's accurate uh, I'm not trying to wiggle out of the question but the systems are so are so different I think that when we um, uh, and that there there really isn't any any comparison between now and then but when I look at the you know african-american incarceration rates and the poverty rates um, Certainly, you see that there, that you know the disparity is so terrible that it cries out for society to address it, and we're and we're not addressing it. Uh, and um, so, but I I, I think that the, you know the, the system hides its operations by saying, well, this is just the way the economy works, or this is just the way the law works. Um, but I think if we had a system that was producing so much misery. For lots of white people, that we would change it. Um, but uh, you see, since I do so much of my work in the past, uh, you know, I'm reluctant to say that it's the sa that it's the same system, and I, I and that it's it, it's gone through so many changes that I you know I, as I said I can't call it the same thing. Okay. Okay. And when, whether or not there is a deliberate, uh, you know the. I don't think that there is anything deliberate going on. I think that it's a, um, that in this country anyway, it may be a form of benign neglect, but I don't think, especially since we have an African-American president in the White House, uh, that we are deliberately seeking to oppress black people, certainly in the way that we did 150 years ago or 200 years ago. Right on. I appreciate that. That is uh, remarkable. That'll be a nice uh, transition to, to getting onto your work about uh, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, but that sounds very similar to many of the defenses that white people have given and continue to give of Thomas Jefferson and that whole era of slavery in this area of the world that uh, this was some form of benign act. It wasn't a deliberate act to stomp on black people and terrorize them. Uh, it sounds very familiar, at least to me. I could be I could be in error. Um, before we get to masters uh, or excuse me, master of the mountain, I did want to get your thoughts. The clip at the beginning, uh, Dr. Robert Jensen, he is also a white man uh, where he was talking about Thomas Jefferson, uh, the him, his premise that number one, this is rape. Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings, if this happened, they had sexual intercourse, produced children. If this happened, this is rape. Thomas Jefferson would be a rapist. It is by default. Uh, slaves cannot give consent. They don't give consent to being a slave. So anything that happens after that uh, would automatically, they're not giving consent to that either. Um, does that make sense to you? What were your thoughts about what Dr. Jensen had to say? Uh, again, I, you know, I'm I'm reluctant to pin the word rapist. It's because in, in the same way that I, you know, I hate to pin the label hypocrite on Jefferson. I think that these, you know, these labels tend to simplify things too much. Um, I the the way I I read Sally Hemings' experience through what their son said uh, in in his uh, account newspaper account that he set down. In 1873, their son Madison Hemings said that his mother Sally Hemings uh, agreed to become Mr. Jefferson's concubine, uh, and that she had become pregnant by him in Paris, and she did not want to go back to Virginia uh, because she, in, in France she was free, and if she went back to Virginia, she would be a slave. 
but he talked. He offered her a deal. He said, "If you come back and be my concubine, your the children that you have by me will be free." Uh, and she she agreed to that. She she consented to that. Um, and you know, some people, you know, including Annette Gordon Reed, say that you know this shows that she was that Sally Hemings was demonstrating her agency. You know, her sexual power over Jefferson. Um, I think that she was a frightened teenage girl who, uh, you know, got her, not got her, but who was made pregnant by Jefferson in Paris and, and didn't have very many good alternatives. Um, and when he said, uh, you know, you, you will live a good life as a slave if, I, if you come home with me, he said that she would have extraordinary privileges and I'll set our children free, that she agreed to return. It, it was actually, for her, the smart choice because she'd be able to rejoin her family and she would also not be cast adrift in, in France where she was just beginning to learn the language. She didn't have that many skills. She would have probably lived a, a, a life that was as bad or worse than the life of a slave in Virginia. So um, uh, she really didn't have much, much choice at all. But to... You know what, Gus, it's a hard thing. It's a hard call. We don't know what that first encounter was like. I mean, she would have been about 15 years old when Jefferson was in his 40s when they had their first sexual encounter. Did he force himself on her? Did she agree because she admired him or because she was afraid? Um, we don't know. I mean, because of the disparity in ages, we look back on it today with some, you know, at least discomfort. I mean, you you uh, mentioned uh, the the uh, Dominique. I can't think of the, the Frenchman's name. Dominique Strauss Kahn. Uh, Dominique Strauss Kahn. I I think of you know Roman Polanski and the thirteen year old girl that that um, he gave drugs to and had sex with. And we you know we were horrified to learn that and. You know the disparity in age between Jefferson and Hemings is 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 more or less the same. Um, you know, um, if you, I, I don't see how a, a forty-something-year-old man can can live with himself doing that to a fifteen-year-old girl. Um, and I, I I hate to use the word rape, but I don't I don't mind if someone else does. Um, that's I just don't want to. I I, I think I, I just find it. I'm very reluctant to. to Categorize it to, char to characterize it that way. It's it's it may, may I don't know why, but I just feel very reluctant to use that word. Wow, that is fascinating. I uh, number one, I want to share the definition of uh, concubine, or at least the one that's uh, on the dictionary I pulled up. Uh, concubine: a woman who lives with a man but has lower status than his wife or wives. Uh, and I think when you were giving your response to that question, you said that Sally Hemings, uh, that she really didn't have a choice uh, in the matter. And I think just that right there, uh, I don't think it's uh, being reductive. Uh, I don't think it's being overly simplistic. Uh, I mean, we could just we could pick two points. Uh, either it's true or it's not. Sally Hemings was a slave. Thomas Jefferson owned Sally Hemings. If that is true. Really, we could stop right there. Uh, in my, at least my understanding, slaves generally don't have the option of saying, you know what, I don't want to go out and pick anything tomorrow. I don't want to do that. Uh, I don't want to do that. Whatever the master says, I don't want to cook supper today. I don't want to clean any clothes today. I don't want to clean your cabin today. That generally is, is not the case for slaves. And I think that would include sexual intercourse. That right there would, in my view, if we're saying rape is the absence of consent, just being a slave would totally erode your ability to consent, even if the slave master asks or propositions you, provides you with some sort of enticing deal that you can't refuse. If you do this, then your children will be free or you'll get extra vittles, you'll get an extra piece of cornbread. All of that would still come under the rubric of rape, just in my view, because she's a slave. She's owned. Uh, the second thing, and I'm glad that you pointed this out because this gets in my view, conveniently kicked to the curb where people don't really say, hey, we're talking about someone in their 40s with a 15-year-old. That just doubles down on it and makes it even worse. Uh, in my opinion, it should be, he's a pedophile. Uh, we can use either or uh, when talking about him. And I think the fact, as you said, you 
being reluctant to use that term and you don't know why. Uh, it sounds like it's not any logic that you can come to as to why you would be reluctant. It seems like you understand the point Dr. Jensen was making and what I'm saying about, hey, the age disparity, the fact that this is slavery, uh, a person would not consent to being a slave. That doesn't really seem like something that can be easily discarded or disagreed with. That's just the reality of what we're talking about. I think that go it goes to the point that Dr. Jensen was saying and to what you said about just the way that many people have responded to your book. I think people have a real problem being honest about the horrors, the abomination of what racism, white supremacy is and white people's culpability in that, be it white people that are still alive right now or white people who've been dead for over 150 years. Uh, does that make sense? Yes, it does. I mean, uh, well, when you're talking about Jefferson or Washington or any of the other founders, you're talking about you know, white America's spiritual and cultural fathers. And it's very, very hard to use words like rape about someone you regard as your spiritual father. Uh, and so you can describe the, the situation between Jefferson and Hemings in just the way I have j just described it and and yet, there is this powerful cultural reluctance to put the word rape on it. Um, let me tell you what happened when I gave the opening talk about my book at, at Monticello. I talked about how Jefferson had turned people, had turned his slaves into money, how he sold them, mortgaged them, how he counted up their births and said that they increased at the rate of 4% a year, in that they increased in value from 5 to 10% a year. And immediately after the, I, I finished speaking, the moderator from Monticello said that Jefferson did not breed slaves. That, are, are you saying that Jefferson was breeding slaves? Now, I was very careful not to use that word. It's very toxic. It, it's insulting to African Americans, and it, and it puts white people off. And, but I said, I, I, I laid out all the evidence and came right up to that point where the, the reader or the listener can say, Jefferson was actually breeding slaves. I want people to come to that conclusion. Or I want people to come to their own conclusions. I don't want to force them. I don't want to drop labels on them. But it's interesting, way back in the 70s, a, a, one of uh, G George Washington's biographers, James Thomas Flexner, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times in which he came right out and said, Thomas Jefferson bred slaves for sale. Uh, and if you said that today, uh, you would get into a lot of trouble from the Jeffersonian community. They, and I got into trouble because I implied that very strongly without using the word. Uh, and, but it, you know, it's clear from the way that he talked about black people, he was encouraging their increase so that he could sell them, so that he could have more black people to mortgage, so that his heirs would have more black people to sell when they were paying off his debts. Uh, but then the, you know, the reader and the listener has to make, you know, come, to, come to his or her own conclusion. Was that breeding slaves? Um, I, don't, I don't want to go that far. And that's why I never. I don't want to use the word hypocrite either because I think it's too easy to label it. Mm. Context of white supremacy. Words, very important words. Uh, I know I, they are. I, I am... I'm going uh, a bit out of order, but I think this is important. Plus, this is a, a concept that we talk about quite a bit on the broadcast. And then I'll backtrack and kind of go to the, some of the earlier portions of your book and even your, your purpose for doing this uh, work that has been uh, stirred up a lot of, of debate, uh, which is probably a good thing. Uh, this is on uh, 269, goes a little bit to 270. Uh, you write, not so very long ago, most historians thought that Jefferson's reputation would be permanently shredded if it were proved that he had fathered children by Sally Hemings. John Chester Miller of Stanford declared in 1977 that if Jefferson did have an affair with Hemings, then he deserves to be regarded as one of the most profligate liars and, uh oh, your word, consummate hypocrites ever to occupy the presidency. Uh, to give credence to the Sally Hemings story is to infer that there were no principles to which he was 
inviolably, inviolably committed that what he acclaimed as morality was no more than a rhetorical facade for self-indulgence and that he was always prepared to make exceptions in his own case when it suited his purpose. In short, beneath his sanctimonious and sententious exterior lay a thoroughly adaptive and amoral public figure. Like so many of those of the present day, even conceding that Jefferson was deeply in love with Sally Hemings does not essentially alter the case. Love does not sanctify such an egregious violation of his own principles and preachments and the shifts and dodges, the paltry artifices to which he was compelled to resort in order to fool the American people. This is back to your wording. But when Typhoon Hemings hit the SS Jefferson, something miraculous occurred. The great vessel heeled over, then slowly righted itself and steamed majestically on its way, flying new flags of multiculturalism and amelioration. Writers redefined the adaptive and amoral Jefferson as the lover of Sally Hemings and the secret tormented father of a multiracial family. A leading Jefferson scholar, Peter Onuf of the University of Virginia, writes, if anything, Jefferson's stock rebounded because Jefferson as lover, no matter how unequal the lover's power, is a more sympathetic character than Jefferson, the owner and exploiter of his fellow human beings. He asks, was Jefferson's image shining more brightly than ever? Uh, this is 269 to 270. Uh, two, I think, really important points. Uh, this is, uh, you quote from John Chester Miller and this rhetorical facade. I think that is something that is very consistent uh, within the system of racism, white supremacy, uh, with Jefferson, him being the father of the Declaration of Independence and all these lofty words about justice and democracy from someone, in my view, who was a racist, a rapist, slave holder, and a pedophile, where they say all these wonderful things, but then you look at their behavior and it is the exact opposite. It could be not it could not be more depraved and terroristic in my view. I think this is something that is common uh, with regards to racist white supremacists and having great words uh, attached to things that they've said, things that they claim to endorse. But when you look at the behavior, it does not match up at all. And I think this is one of the big reasons why many white people are very resistant to any sort of new interpretation and, and really pulling out the truth using the word rape using the word racist to talk about Thomas Jefferson uh, can you I guess just comment on on what's labeled the rhetorical facade what I'm saying is just rhetorical ethic can you comment on that a bit uh, yes I mean Je Jefferson uh, cared very deeply about his image as a liberal and he cared very deeply about his image as someone who wanted to free his slaves who wanted to be on the right side of morality, but he was always prevented from doing the right thing by his debts or by his law, by, by the laws of Virginia. Uh, but he, it, I think that my, my research brings out that he was really fully committed to perpetuating the slave system because it was so profitable. Uh, and he really helped to invent the language of, of racism. Uh, the, but you know the the question of Jefferson's racism is is very hard to uh, untangle because you know he wrote that that the mixing of the races was one of the worst things that he could imagine and yet he had children with Sally Hemings who was a mixed race woman so those children would be mixed race uh, and so how is it that he could that that he could live with that um, and. My answer is, is, is really his power, in that he had complete power over, over his world, and he could reorder reality to suit the, what was inside of his, of his own head. Uh, and, so, and I think that, that, that John Chester Miller was right when he said that Jefferson was always willing to make exceptions for, for himself. Um, and uh, he... Sally Hemings, unfortunately, was one of the ways in which Jefferson made slavery more palatable to himself. Uh, he surrounded himself 
with very, very light-skinned slaves, so that his experience of slavery was, in his view, a very genteel one. I mean, the, he was very careful to feed and clothe these slaves very well and to train them very well so that he was not forced to confront the harsher issues of, of slavery. Uh, and so they really became the tools, his tools, by, by which he made slavery more acceptable to, to himself. Um, but John Chester Miller was, was absolutely right in that um, you know, Jefferson's reputation should have been shredded when it turned out that we, it, we found proof that, that he had children with Sally Hemings. But the, the culture's love for Jefferson is such that we had to, the white America had to turn that around and make it into something good. And what they did was to say, okay, well, he must have loved her. And, you know, there are African-American writers who say the same thing. Um, and, you know, Barbara Chase Trabu said that in her novel, Sally Hemings. And uh, Annette Gordon-Reed very strongly implies it in her book, The Hemingses of, of, of Monticello. Um, and because in, in her mind, Sally Hemings was not uh, a, a powerless victim. She was a smart, strong woman who made good choices. Uh, and she had what the scholars like to call agency, and that she had power over Jefferson. I don't believe any of that. I think that she was almost 100% powerless in the face of, of his power and his, his ownership and, and his demands. Um, but uh, Professor Gordon Reed wants to present uh, to the culture an image of a strong slave so I think that she's, she's built a false image of what the relationship was like and gives Sally Hemings more strength and more power than she ever actually had. I, I follow what uh, Madison Hemings said, that, he was, that she was just a concubine uh, and that she spent her life being Jefferson's housemaid and that you know, the, the privileges that she got consisted of being able to, to have her children around her all the time. Which is not, uh, which in, under slavery was a, a wonderful gift, but it's not, it's, it's not exactly an extraordinary privilege. Um, so, but the culture cannot accept Jefferson doing evil to Sally Hemings. And I think that even some African American historians and commentators don't want to accept that either. Hmm. I want to, uh, you kind of touched on it already we we have had uh some of the black people victims of racism unfortunately uh on our broadcast who have i don't even i mean it's it's nauseating it's repulsive uh when i hear and they're victims i'm not bashing i'm just it's very difficult for me to even listen to people when they attempt to go that route of saying oh this was this was a romance on the plantation and they really loved each other and Thomas Jefferson and and Sally Hemings they cared for one another and this was a a a wonderful passionate relationship I just think that is total bunkum uh we're talking about slavery (laughs) I mean really if, if it was if it was really all that and maybe they did care about one another uh we can't ignore the same two principles I bought up before the age difference and slavery Uh, and I think there's a great deal I mean you talk about revisionist history I think there's a great deal of revisionist history in pushing novels and films that give this notion and it's not just with Jefferson I see this happen a lot with plantation fiction uh, where some white slave owner uh, has this loving wonderful relationship with his slave owner and I think that that uh, it helps uh, to make it more soothing to think about slavery as not being that bad and white people and black people. It's, it's really, it seems just like a newer version of the same thing that was being said during the antebell- uh, antebellum period that black people really were not that upset about slavery. This really wasn't that bad of an arrangement. Things, you know, weren't as bad as we like to make them seem on the plantation being so far removed from them. Um, I guess with the with the love aspect, it seems like you're you're coming. You're pretty. It seems like we're in, at least in agreement on that point in saying that you also do not think that is that's malarkey. Am I am I understanding you correctly on the love point? Oh, I think I think it's complete malarkey oh. uh, because I'm I'm going by what their son said, and he's the one who said that that she that his mother was Jefferson's concubine. 
Uh, and that, that's a very, very ugly, nasty word to use about your own mother. But he was a very honest, Madison was a very honest man. Um, and elsewhere in his uh, memoir, he talked about the relationship between Thomas Jefferson and his white wife, wife Martha, and he said that a, an, inti- an intimacy sprang up between them which ripened into love, and they were married. So he knew how to describe romantic love, and he used those words to describe Martha and Thomas Jefferson. When he talked about his own mother, he used the word concubine. Uh, so you know he was there; he saw it. I mean, it was a it was a very cold blooded transaction. I I think that Sally Hemings made a deal uh, to get uh, you know decent treatment for herself and to get her children freed. And I, I think that Madison had a great deal of respect for her. Uh, for going through all the going through what she went through on the mountain as a slave to get her children free, he owed he owed his freedom to his mother's deal that she made with Jefferson. Um, one of the interesting things uh, that struck me in my research is that there is there is no recognition in Jefferson's records that Sally Hemings had any special status in his mind. I mean, there's no uh, you know, he never mentions her. I mean, th- th- she's just mentioned in the business records. I mean, there's there are no notes to her. There's no mention. You know, please look after her, or please have her visit me, or uh, no recollection sent to her. There's no evidence at all of any emotional attachment. Um, and that that to me that 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 says a lot. That she was just in his mind. She was just a creature in the house who was available for his sexual gratification. Um, and, I mean, as far as we know, she, she couldn't read and write. How can he have any kind of an equal relationship? He's one of the, 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 the greatest geniuses in, in, in the continent, uh, one of the most learned men. How can he have any kind of an of a, of a equal relationship with a woman whom he keeps illiterate? Uh, that that's one of the things that struck me. If he really loved her, he would have taught her to read and write. He would have given her books. Uh, he would have insisted that she be treated in very special ways. But we don't see any of that. Mm. I would like to be free. Uh, <laughs> I would like to be uh, free. That could that would be a great start, in my opinion. But I, I think those are, are all uh, yes, excellent right, points. Right. Well, you know, he did. He he freed his children. Um, I don't see that as a great act of benevolence on his part. I think that you have to, you know, keep in mind that uh, those four children who survived to adulthood were his blood children. And so when he saw them, he saw himself. Uh, and I think that it would have given him nightmares to know that his own flesh and blood would remain slaves for their entire lives. And that what he had done to Sally Hemings would happen to his daughter, Harriet. That she would become the concubine of a white man. Uh, and he didn't want that fate to befall her. That's, that's, that's my speculation. I don't, I don't think that it was a great act of generosity or benevolence on his part to free those four children um, because they were his kids. And I think he, he couldn't have done I mean, he would have been a completely depraved monster if he had left them in slavery. I, I think it would just have been unimaginable. Although a lot of slave masters did. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that's one of the really ugly things about, about slavery. You know, um, years ago, before the DNA test, back in 1992, there was a conference here at the University of Virginia uh, about Jefferson, and someone in the audience asked the, the, the scholars whether or not Jefferson could have had children with Sally Hemings. And this, as I said, is about nine years before, no, no, about seven years before the DNA tests were done. And all the scholars said, no, 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 he could never have had children with Sally Hemings because he would never have been so depraved as to hold his own children in slavery. And Julian Bond was there, and he stood up and said something that always, that 
stuck in my mind for years and still does to this day. He said Thomas Jefferson had already held other people in slavery. From there, it was only a short step to holding his own children in slavery. And I think that what Julian Bond had put into words was the, the, the terrible, corrupting power of owning people. It changes your way of thinking. You think you can do anything. Uh, and Jefferson felt that he had that almost absolute power, that he said, well, I will have children who are slaves. Um, and it will be up to me to look after them when, when the time comes. But uh, just the, the notion that you, could, that you could bring a baby into slavery is just horrible to me, but it wasn't horrible to him. And I think it's because of the corrupting power of slavery. Mm. Context of white supremacy. Uh, I wanted to touch on Annette Gordon Reed because she uh, had some. She's written a review of your book, several of your books, actually. Uh, quickly, I just wanted to point out for the listeners: uh, you have seen this before, the Thomas Jefferson, uh, whether it's Strom Thurmond, Monsters Ball, white person who is racist, uh, whether in real life or fiction white person who is racist and still has sexual intercourse with black people it should not be that confusing shouldn't be that strange uh it is not uh difficult for a racist white supremacist uh it is not out of character for them to be in the bedroom uh with a non-white person even married sometimes to a non-white person and i don't even think that that in any way conflicts with racist white supremacist beliefs uh in fact i think that is one of the worst acts of racism white supremacy so just to keep that in mind you're still seeing this 21st century um the annette uh, annette gordon reed uh, she also has written extensively uh, about thomas jefferson uh, Sally Hemings, she also, uh, she did favorably, uh, reviewed, uh, your book, Imperfect God. Uh, she also said that she was a big fan of the Harrisons, an American family in black and white. Uh, she was very critical, uh, of Master of the Mountain. Uh, people can read her review. It's at slate.com. The title of it is Thomas Jefferson was not a monster debunking a major new biography of our third president uh, she published it in the 2012 you can check it out uh, quick sentence from the report she writes uh, Henry Winsek is not at all conflicted he loathes Thomas Jefferson in Master of the Mountain Thomas Jefferson and his slaves his attempted takedown of the man the third president appears as a demonic figure warped one summer day by a sudden discovery that being a slaveholder could pay uh, you have offered your response to what Annette Gordon uh, Reed has said about your work. It's in detail. Folks can read that online. Uh, specifically, I guess with two points that I wanted to pick out. Uh, number one, uh, the issue of agency. You touched on that before. Uh, Annette Gordon Reed, I think in, in both of her works, actually, I think she pulls out a lot of information, uh, not trying to run from the fact that, hey, Thomas Jefferson is a racist. I don't think. Uh, I'm familiar with her work I didn't come away with the impression that she was trying to make Thomas Jefferson out to be a nice guy a a benevolent slave owner is that the impression that you took when you read her work oh yes it is I mean she said that Jefferson devised a kinder gentler slavery that's her phrase kinder and kinder gentler slavery I don't think that was true at all Uh, I think that he devised um, uh, a a more psychologically oppressive slavery for the for his black relatives. I mean, for the there, there was a hierarchy of slaves at Monticello, farther down the mountain and at the distant plantations. I think the people were treated very brutally. They were under the the supervision of the overseers directly and all the time. And I think that punishment was unleashed very very frequently. When you got closer to the top of the mountain. Uh, where Jefferson lived, I mean, he clustered his African and his black relatives around the top of the mountain. He gave them better housing, better jobs, better food. They had access to him. So their treatment superficially was better. But they realized that all of the benefits that they had flowed from him. So they were forced into a psychological posture of permanent gratitude and permanent deference. And he also drilled into them that they were inferior, that they were second class, 
they knew that they had Jefferson blood, but they would not. They did not have the same privileges and the same status as his grandchildren or or his children. And this had to have done great psychological damage to those people. I mean, they you know they knew the truth, and yet the truth was being denied by their own father and grandfather. Um, so I I don't call that a a kinder, gentler slavery. Uh, and Jefferson also realized that by offering a few selected people better jobs and incentives and a little bit of cash that he could get them to do more work and to do better work. Uh, his uh, John Hemings, who was uh, Sally Hemings' uh, brother, was, his, was Jefferson's cabinet maker. Uh, a white cabinet maker got $120 a year. John Hemings got 20 and Jefferson said that, that the work that Hemings did was some of the finest in the United States. Um, so what kind of message does that send to a man if you encourage him by saying, you do wonderful work, I'm having you build the finest mansion in the country, but I'm only paying you $20 a year because that's all you're worth because of your color. Uh, you know, that is a terrible psychological degradation to inflict on one of your own relatives. Um, and so I don't call that kind and gentle at all. I call that psychological brutality. Hmm. One of the other uh, major issues uh, with Annette Gordon-Reed, uh, the term agency, a uh, very popular term uh, if you study history. Um, for listeners, agency just meaning uh, generally they're talking about some 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 form of mistreatment, a system of mistreatment. So generally when they're talking about the victims of this mistreatment, when they say agency in that context, it generally means that these people uh, have their own will. They have the ability to act in their own self-interest uh, for their own freedom, better treatment, uh, getting away from being abused, subjugated. That's generally what's meant uh, when the term agency is used. Um, you, I think, towards the conclusion uh, of the book, go to that and you take issue uh, by saying that you feel many historians, uh, Annette Gordon-Reed included, uh, have painted a picture uh, focusing so much on the agency of the slaves that they have left out the culpability uh, of the white slave owners and saying, hey, this is not just a story of how wonderful and great all of the acts of the slaves were to free themselves and to resist slavery. Uh, let's make sure to keep in mind that these folks are being subjugated, that these folks are being mistreated. Um, can you kind of give more of your viewpoint on this this concept of agency and, and your view about how this is being perhaps misrepresented when we talk about slavery? Yes, well, actually, you've, you, you've summarized it very well. I think that... Um, Oh, in, in many ways, um, uh, public house, I mean, uh, public institutions like Monticello, which Monticello, the Monticello historians and archaeologists have done tremendous work on bringing us information and research about how the enslaved people lived and how hard they worked and how they worked and how skilled they were and how they struggled to keep their families together and. Uh, and and sometimes scholars use you know apply the word resistance to very simple things like being married or having children or teaching your children skills. They say that well the the enslaved were resisting the institution by keeping their families together. Well, I I don't agree with that. I mean I I think that you know they kept their families together because the the husbands and wives loved each other and they. They love their children, and I don't think they had any consciousness that, well, we're fighting, we're fighting against old master by, by loving, loving ourselves, uh, by loving each other. Um, the other thing is, you can have all the agency in the world. You can, <laughs> I mean, you can be the finest worker. You can be the best husband or the best wife or the best mother in slavery. It's not going to get you free. The masters actually encouraged what we call agency. They wanted the enslaved to work hard. They wanted the enslaved to acquire skills and to form family units and to bring up children who were accustomed to the slave system. 
the masters loved the idea of what we call agency because it made all of those people better slaves. It made them more productive. There was no way out. That's the horror of the system. There was no way out. And no matter how hard you worked, this was something that was that I learned years ago when I was writing the Hairston's book. There was a slave at one of the Hairston plantations in Henry County, Virginia. His name was Sam Lyon. And he was married to a woman named Kate. He had, I forget, a large number of children. He had nine or ten children. And he was a very, very highly regarded carpenter. He w did so well that the master allowed him to earn his own money and uh, Sam Lyon used that money to buy his own tools. He had more tools than the white people had. Uh, and so whenever the white overseer needed to borrow a tool uh, for some project, he would go to Sam. And they were on good terms, this, the overseer and Sam. And Sam would allow him to borrow one of, one of his tools. Uh, well, lo and behold, one day the master, Marster, um, Marshall Harston, decides that his slaves aren't working hard enough. So he brings in a new overseer, someone who gets his way by beating people. He came in with a with a with a whip that had an iron handle. It was called a loaded a loaded whip. It was it had one purpose to beat people, and it could if you were hit with it, it was like being hit with an iron bar. And he wanted to establish his his hegemony immediately. So he told Sam one day out in the fields, "Go and get me one of your tools," and Sam said, "No." I mean, when, when Sam had previously worked with, a, with, with the overseer that he was friendly with, Sam would cooperate. He would do whatever, because they, they were friends, and he would do whatever the other fellow wanted. But with this new guy, who was a bastard, Sam would not cooperate. So the overseer said, peel off your shirt, you're getting a whipping. And to this also, Sam said, no, I won't submit to that. Now that's agency. That's resistance right there. And then Sam, knowing that you can't fight directly against an overseer, turned his back and tried and walked away to try to avoid the confrontation. At that moment, the overseer ran toward him with that iron handle raised over his head to kill Sam. Somebody cried out. Sam turned around. He had an ax in his hand, and he swung his ax to defend himself. It plunged right into the chest of the overseer who died on the spot. Now, Sam ran away. He hid, but his friends, the other overseer, persuaded him to give himself up and go to court because he thought that the white people in that county would stand up for a good, honest, hard-working slave like Sam. Did they? No. He was condemned to hang. So that showed me that you could have all the agency, all the goodness under the slave system that you wanted, and the, the white system still looked upon you as nothing more than a slave. And if you, even in self-defense, if you killed a white man, they didn't see the self-defense. They saw that you had disrupted the power system. So to me, that just showed me agency meant nothing. Sam had it in spades. Sam had a bucket full of it. It didn't do him any good. Uh, and it's the same on Monticello Mountain. You could work as hard as you want. You could make as much profit as you, as you could for your master. Jefferson was never going to let you go. A few people got out. They were um, his relatives. They had special relations to him. So when Annette Gordon-Reed and others talk about the agency of the slaves, I think this is, a, this is a fantasy. It was a completely oppressive system, completely. Mm. Wow. Great example. Um, the last uh, point that I wanted to hit on, uh, Annette Gordon-Reed and others, I think other people have raised this issue in saying that uh, in – your book, you are presenting a lot of this information as though this is a revelation, as though this is the first time that uh, someone is making a serious indictment of Thomas Jefferson and saying that this is not some wonderful guy. This, you know, this guy's a racist uh, and pointing out the details, uh, how children uh, were being beaten uh, at Monticello and, and think different bits of information that have not been as publicized, not been as talked about. Uh, many of the folks who have been critical of your work have said that, hey, a lot of scholars have talked about this before, and this is not the first time the public is privy to this information. What is your response to that? 
Well, she's wrong about that. I mean, I mean, she yeah, she's very invested in this. As I said, in this image of Sally Hemings as a strong woman who made good choices, and in her view, in Annette Gordon Reed's view, we can't have Sally Hemings going to bed with a monster. So when I found all of this very, very damning information in the records, which certainly Annette Gordon Reed had never published, Annette comes out and tries to discredit it because it makes Sally Hemings look bad. It makes her look bad for, you know, collaborating. And Annette has a section in her book where she ponders the question of whether the Hemingses were collaborators with Jefferson's slave system. I don't think they were collaborators. I think that they were all victims of it to one degree or another. They didn't, you, you were right at the beginning of the show when, and you were Professor Jensen, that, you know, uh, these people didn't have that many choices. Um, but Gordon Reed is wrong when she says that you know that the, the important information in the book has all been published before. Some of it has, but I have a, a, a very different take on it. But I want that the most important information in my book is all new. Nobody knew that the children were being whipped at Jefferson's nail factory to get them to work. The, the head historian at Monticello didn't know that until I told her. And actually, I have a videotape of her reaction, because I, I mentioned it at a, at a lecture in Charlottesville. And she questioned me on it. She said, no, 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 that can't be true. And I told her that she was, she was working from a sanitized document and had not seen the full document. And you can see in the video this look of shock come across her face when she realizes that all of her scholarship has been based on faulty research. Nobody has published the information that Jefferson was counting the children and calculated that he had a 4% increase per year at Monticello. Annette Gordon-Reed refuses to accept that, and that's the plain meaning of the document. That's new. I also published the information that Jefferson calculated that slaves increased 5 to 10% a year in value. She never published that. That's new. Uh, and there are a number of other things uh, that I, there are stories that have come out in pieces, but I put them all together in a different way, and I think I show them in a more accurate light. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's the story of uh, Sally Hemings' older sister, Mar Mary Hemings, who had four children. She, uh, when Jefferson was in France, she left the plantation to become the wife of a wealthy white merchant from Charlottesville, a man named Thomas Bell, Oh, she had two children before, and then she had two children with Thomas Bell. And when Jefferson came back from France, Mary Hemings went to him and said, my husband wants to buy the children, let's, let's come to some accommodation. Well, you often see this presented as Mary, the feisty Mary Hemings you know, willing to bargain and negotiate with Jefferson. But what was the deal that he offered her? He said, okay, you have four children. Pick two. You can keep two of your children. The other two are coming back to me as slaves. Now, what kind of agency is that? Now, now I, don't, I present that story, I think, in its more accurate light, that Jefferson looked upon these families as providing a kind of subsidy for, him, for himself and for his heirs. I don't spin it as a happy plantation tale of Mary Hemings showing agency and spunkiness and negotiating savvy. How would you like to lose two of your children to slavery? I mean, how would you make that choice? Um, so, I mean, th there are, in, there is information that others, that, that not others, that Cinder Stanton, the head historian at Monticello, have published before. The general public doesn't know these stories. Uh, that's why I, I mean, that, that's why when, when I bring out these stories, People have said to me, people who read the book, people who read the Smithsonian excerpt have said, I've never known any of this before. This is all new to me. Um, so, I mean, Annette is just trying to discredit the work. Uh, much of the information in it is new, uh, and certainly my interpretations are new. She's just trying to discredit it. And also, I mean, this nonsense that I, mean, that I loathe Jefferson, that comes out of her head. Um, I started out feeling very neutral about him, and my I, I won't go into what my feelings are about him now. So, um, but that's her way of making unpleasant facts go away. Hmm. Okay. 
Um, there's a, there are other folks, not just uh, Annette Gordon Reed. There are other. Uh, if you read the New York Times review of Mr. Uh, Winsek's book, uh, they list quite a few other uh, scholars and some of the points that they uh, raise uh, with the book, in particular that last issue about saying that a lot of this information they feel has been presented before. Uh, you can check the article and see what they have to say as well. Uh, I do see uh, folks that have hands uh, want to get their input as well. Uh, I'll give out the number uh, the number to dial. 760-569-7676 and the code is 564-943-POUND. Press star 6 if you have questions uh, for Mr. Henry Winsick. Number again 760-569-7676 the code Five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you have questions. I feel like I've said her name so much. It would be great if she had been on the program. She could have spoke for herself. Annette Gordon Reed. Uh, check out her work. You can compare uh, and contrast the Hemings of Monticello. Uh, she actually has done more than one work. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, an American controversy. She wrote that as well. Uh, 1997. Uh, the first one was published uh, 2008, I believe. Second one was published. I might be incorrect about the date. Uh, I will run right down the line, take a few of our callers because I do see hands. Uh, the person that called in uh, 82. Oh, uh, sorry, Princess. Your line is open. If you had a question for Mr. Winsec, your line should be open, Princess. Hi, Gus. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, good evening to the guests. I just had a couple of questions, and I'll make sure that I keep uh, mind of the time. Um, my first question was, uh, Gus had given the definition in regards to white supremacy, and I wasn't clear whether or not you had answered it either, so I was wondering, could you say that the social and economic situation blacks are in today in the U.S. aren't present globally where blacks reside? Well, um, I you know what I, I I will dodge that question also because I have certainly not studied the the um, conditions in Africa as much as I've studied conditions in 18th and 19th century America. Um, so I, I I I really can't answer that if to, to say whether it's a universal condition or not. Okay, well, I was actually, I had wrote down a couple of lists of countries like uh, in India, the UK, Australia, South Africa, South America, so not just Africa, but. Well, I just gave a talk here at UVA about um, the very interesting artworks by a, a woman named Judy Watson who is both Aboriginal and, and European. And she was responding, she, she did six etchings that were based on Jefferson's uh, designs for the University of Virginia. And on them, she, in her words, she floated images that represent the miscegenation or the, the mixing of the, of the races. And she used uh, images of nails from Mr. Jefferson's nail factory. And in an interview, she told stories about her own family that were remarkably similar to stories of American slavery. She talked about how uh, the police would come to steal the mixed race children, the, 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 the children who were part white and part Aboriginal, they'd steal them from their mothers and bring them to uh, missions, so-called missions that Judy Watson said were more or less prisons. And they would be trained as small children to be domestics and then sent into the farmhouses of white people to be housekeepers or cooks or or, or yard men or uh, farmers and it was the, the situations were very much the same in uh, in Australia until relatively recent times as they were in uh, in, in slavery time in America. Okay, and um, do you think that uh, earlier you was talking about the um, how Jefferson um, had somewhat of a warped mentality in, in regards uh, to how he treated his uh, children. 
Um, do you think that warped mentality during formal slavery that white people had in owning slaves is still plays out in the prison industrial complex and in regard to how black people are treated? Well, Princess, that's a big question. Um, that's one you, you, uh, you, you're probably better equipped than I to answer that. I really hate to make those comparisons across time. I mean, there are just too many differences. Okay. I have one more question, if it's okay, Gus. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. Um, in, in relation to Sally, Sally Hemming, in regards to, I, I guess, what could be described as somewhat preferential treatment in regards to her relationship with uh, uh, Jefferson, do you think that since you were um, since you were hesitant in call, not wanting to call him a rapist, in in retrospect and looking at his behavior towards uh, Sally Hemings and in regards to giving her gifts, feeding her better, and you know clothing her better and stuff like that, um, in light of what's going on now in regards to the church as well as you know just in the public in regards to these child molestation cases, do you think that you could kind of see that resembling what, what's known as called, or what is known as grooming, grooming slaves, you know, the light-skinned slaves? Oh, that's, that's an interesting observation. Uh, I, I never thought of it that way. Um... Because a lot of people, it just seems like most people kind of like Gus was saying earlier, it's kind of getting to the point now it's like where people are trying to think of ways to romanticize uh, about slavery because they want to distance themselves, like you were saying, from the, the harsh reality and brutality of it. So when you're talking about, you know, she was, I believe, 15 years old and he was 40, uh, you know, a lot of pedophiles... In his early you know, 40s, they, yeah. Oh, okay. A lot of pedophiles, when, when they go after uh, young um, boys or girls or who, young children in general, you know, it, it's a stage in, in um, their... Uh, or a process that they go through in regards to grooming, uh, you know, that individual... It's not that they're giving, you know, same thing with Sandusky. It's not that he was giving presents and doing things for the, these kids because because he really loved them and cared for them and this, that, and the other. He he was a he was a grown man who already knew what he was going to do. So I just find it um, uh, interesting that most people will try and put the burden on someone like Sally Hemings who as you, you stated, had no power. I, and I'm just trying to figure out why it would be hard for someone to just see see someone like Jefferson for what it is, you know. Well, in, in, I have avoided, in, in, in my book and to this day, I have avoided speculating too much about what happens between Sally Hemings and Jefferson in Paris. I mean, Annette Gordon-Reed has a long section about it. Uh, and she has a long section about, or not a long section, but she has a, a vivid section about Jefferson buying clothes for Sally Hemings. I mean, that's on the record that he did buy clothes for her. Um, but Gordon Reed go, goes into a lot of psychological speculation about what might have been going on between them mentally at that moment. I don't engage in any of that because... I think it's just too speculative. I don't want to go there. I base my statements on what their son, Madison, said. And I, I try to ground everything I say very firmly in a document from that time, something I can point to. Um, and so I don't want to use words like, like grooming. I mean, well, but, but I mean, when you think about it, I mean, all right, Sally Hemings is a 14-, 15-year-old girl she goes across the across the other side of the world. She's living in a magnificent house in an exciting city with one of the most powerful, famous men in the world, who seems to have endless amounts of money. 
Um, so it's certainly a very seduct seductive situation. How much Jefferson deliberately used all of that to groom her is is something that you, know, you would have to that you'd make up your mind about that yourself. I, um, I I'm not going to make any speculations about that. Okay. Well, I, I would just, I, I think it would be more accurate in, um, you know, just saying that, you know, that type of behavior, and this is not just for Jefferson, but that, you know, he was groom, grooming, you know, just white men during that time groomed their slaves for sexual exploitation. I think that would be more accurate in describing what that particular behavior was. But um, it's, thank you for answering uh, um, my Yeah, question. some of them, some of them did. You know, I, I'm sure went through that grooming process. Others just asserted themselves. I mean, um, others, other slave masters just forced themselves uh, on, on 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 the women. I mean, in, in the grossest, most violent ways. And we, you know, we have records of that in the sl in the slave narratives. Um, I don't. I mean, per perhaps Jefferson. You know, was gentle around Sally Hemings because she was the half sister of his wife. Um, but I, I, I don't pretend to know what went on in Paris beyond what Madison Hemings said that she became pregnant and she became Jefferson's concubine. He he doesn't go into more detail than that. Okay, thank you. Uh, person that dialed in. Uh, oh, this is Bruce Fine. Bruce Fine, if you had a question for Mister Winsek, your line should be open. Hi, uh, good evening, Gus, and good evening um, to your your guest. Um, I, I just want to start off first by saying that I'm I'm really offended um, at the guest referring to Jefferson as relative. Um, I think this is a, a very refined way of a white person humanizing uh, another white person who enslaved. Uh, my ancestors against their will. Um, the, and, and I think the difference between white people today and white people during slavery is that they were more honest. They were very explicit. They were very open about who they were, what they felt about my ancestors and the system of slavery. They pulled no punches. They were very explicit. Um, and then, then like, uh, I can't think of the, the first caller's name, but she said, uh, white people today are romanticizing slavery. And I, I just want to ask the guest this. What would you call a 40-year-old man who is gutter sexing your 15-year-old daughter? Please tell me honestly some of the names that you would call him. And, 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 and I just know that you would be gnashing your teeth if your daughter came home and said, Daddy, but I, I love him, Daddy. Tell me, tell me what would you say and how much anger you would say it with. And if he impregnated your daughter, I'm sure you would not call that so-called man relative, father, of that child. I think you would call him monster, pedophile, evil, so on, rapist, so on and so forth. And it would take all of heaven and hell to keep you off of that man legally and physically. So to try and romanticize what Jefferson and all of the other white men and, 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 and white women for that matter because I'm sure that they were sexually suing and gutter sexing uh, those young black boys back then. So, so please, if you're not going to call the 40-year-old man who would, uh, uh, God forbid, do this to your daughter, relative, and, 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 and making up all of this for your daughter, please do not do this for Sally Jefferson or any other a uh, 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 person who was enslaved by Jefferson or any other uh, uh, person uh, back then. Well, I think you've 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 put it very well. 
Um, but I'm not trying to romanticize the relationship at all by using the word relative. What I try, ne- try never to forget is that the people in a condition of slavery could not fight back. They had to take it. Um, and the, the, you know, they were completely under, under Jefferson's power, and any kind of, of protest was, was fruitless. Um, and, you know, a number of, a number of historians uh, have said that Sally Hemings may have calculated that she could get herself a better life if she became um, his mistress. And that probably, uh, you know, th- that, that probably caused splits between her family and other enslaved people on the mountain who were as disgusted as, as you are by this relationship. But I don't know. I, that we, we, don't, we don't have any, any evidence for that. It's all, it's, uh, it's, it's just our, you know, we're just looking back and trying to figure out what other people might have thought. My, my view was, go ahead. Uh, uh, Gus, like you, like you were saying earlier about words, uh, you know, saying that she made a deal and calculating, and I mean, this this, this is just absolutely disgusting. Um, uh, again, even uh, today's young girls would not be. <laughs> Uh, uh, thought of as calculating and making a deal with a, a 40-year-old so-called man. And back then, I mean, they have laws, at, you know, against that today. Yeah. I, I mean, just, the, just your, your choice of words, relationship. I, I, I just think, again... I'm I'm just upset, but you know I'm sure you know this is this is no, I, this, no, from I, your, I, your I, I words you that. you could care less, but um I mean you would not I'm just you would not call it a relationship if a fifth if your fifteen year old daughter was being gutter sexed by a forty year old man you wouldn't you know you would not say relationship. You know if he, he, he manipulated her and she was sneaking out, you wouldn't say, Honey, you're being calculating. You would yeah. you would go and sing. And you would not use the words that you are using tonight and you know it. Well, well I'm it was, Gus, thank uh, you for the opportunity to uh, say what I had to say. Okay. Were uh, Mr. Winsett, were you? I didn't know if you were trying to get a response in. No. Well, I think that the caller has re- uh, has really uh, summed up the the ugliness of the era and the ugliness of of slavery. Um, and when I use words like relationship or relative, I'm not trying to sugarcoat it at all. Um, I think that in some very dim way, Jefferson was. When he treated the people he had blood ties to better, uh, you know, he was doing it really for his own sake, not so much for theirs, but because he could see his blood running in their veins or the blood of his his wife's family. Um, he did it because he had a, a a blood kinship with them, not because he felt any great sense of benevolence towards them. Um, but I think that your your caller has is probably very accurately summed up a lot of the rage that people felt then, but they, they couldn't express it they, because they didn't have any power to express it. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm talking about you and your words. Why are you using the words that you're using? You mean like relationship and um, relative? Calculating. Deal. She made a deal. Well, I think that in a situation as ugly as slavery, and that if you had the choice, not you, maybe if a person had the choice of becoming the concubine of the master and getting herself a lifetime of living inside the mansion or in a good cabin with good clothes and good food, as opposed to being sent farther down the mountain to work under the overseers in the fields where 
she was she could be raped by any one of the overseers or a passing white worker at any time, she might have made a choice. Um, it's not much of a choice, but um, you know, she she might very well have decided that this was in her interest. I don't. I, I mean, I don't know what happened in Paris. I don't know if he forced, if Jefferson forced himself upon her, or if she had any. Of course, she's 15 years old. What does she know? I agree with you. She doesn't have any. She doesn't have any sense yet. Um, and if she's not a thing, she's a, a back in slavery 15 year old. If it's right. horrible today, it's a hundred times horrible back then. We're not talking yeah, about but, some free, free fifteen-year-old. Miss, man, I don't defend it, but you know, other people strangely do. I mean, I, I don't, I don't defend it at all. I, I, my thinking is closer to yours than to to other people. So, I mean, there are, you know, historians who say that Sally Hemings made a choice. Well, if you're saying she made deals and calculating, then our, our thinking is 180 degrees apart from one another. Well, I but don't I, think but I'm sure, but I'm, I'm sure, again, if the, if the shoe was on the other foot and we were talking about uh, another group enslaving white people, and a white 15-year-old, and white 15-year-olds back then, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, your use of, of uh, words would be different. But again, well, Josh, thank say, you. Yeah. All right, thank you. A uh, person that called in from the Bronx, Bronx caller, did you have a question for Mr. Winsack? Your line should be open. Uh, um, good evening. Thanks, uh, Gus. Um, informational program here. Um, hello, the guests and to the callers. Can I hear? Yes, sir. All right. Um, interesting. Uh, um, what I was thinking was um about Quivenzene Wallace and the comment that they made about her recently. So, um, uh. Uh, basically calling her, uh, you know, you know, you know what they called her, but yeah, I, I didn't hear. Who are you talking about? Um, the actress Quavenzene Wallace. She's a black female, I think twelve or twelve years old, and nine. She was the, nine. My gosh, yeah, and she's a uh, the youngest uh, nominee for best actress. Oh, yes, yeah, she was in Beasts of the Southern Wild, yes. Yes, and they called her a cunt. Oh, I didn't hear that. Yeah, it was a joke. It was a joke. It was, I guess they were joking, and they called her that. Um, I just wanted to quote it. I'm sorry to inject the uh, pejorative, but um, just to be... Um, That's funny. I never, I never, I never, I haven't heard that. It's funny. I'm sorry. You say that, that it's funny. No, I said I have never. I have never heard. I didn't. I didn't hear that remark. Uh, um. I just wanted. Yeah, it was pretty recent. A couple of days ago, I guess. Um, the Onion newspaper. They were making a joke, and they were just. I guess. Uh, I guess they well, never. You know, white people. I guess they find it funny. But, um, anyway, I was thinking about, um, what, 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 uh, just in the conversation, you're saying that, um, you know, you were saying that she didn't have a choice, and then you said that she had a choice, and you're saying she had a little bit of a choice, and that I guess the choice is between getting raped by someone whom, uh, You've already met or getting raped by a bunch of strangers. I don't know, it doesn't really seem like really a choice so much as a um, controlled demolition or something. But, um, of a person. But, um, it just, and, and uh, I like that. I, I think that's a very good way of putting it. The controlled demolition of a person. 
white all white people. Um, and it's just like I mean the whole time I mean like I was reading an article yesterday uh, I guess Imari over Daily. Um, he, uh, I was reading an article about this 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 um black person who was um making some really good points about how we were never um we never you know since we didn't like I guess the whole terms uh, of um of like the terms black and white it seems to me like more terms like uh op very oppositional. Uh, hello? Oh, oh I'm, no, I'm still here. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah, black and white seems like it's like war terms, you know? And, um... And so they, they didn't have c consent at that point, and then they didn't have consent to become uh, so-called citizens after they were emancipated. It wasn't, like, their choice. They just... It was just like... You know... You know... Get out of the plantation now. You're, uh, you know, you're free. You know, you're free to, you know, you know, to, to be abject. You know, more. And then, and then just uh, like, um, so there's this heavy burden. This there's um, well, it's like white people are. Like like you tonight, you're not really acknowledging the fact that there's a system white supremacy. I've concluded that there is, you know. But um, it seems to me like uh, a large part of white people's um, uh, attractiveness is the fact that they're dominating us. Like so, you 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 guys have more resources. Like in the case of Sally Hemings. He was able to kind of, you know, um, court her, you could say, with, uh, you know, like I was saying, giving her a couple extra portions of food, giving her some clothing or whatever. So I, I guess I was just asking if you see that, um, it, not if you see it, but um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you think that uh, that adds to the present if you're, you're saying that there, there is not a system of white supremacy? But why would people who were oppressed, like, for, you know, hundreds of years, why would they even want to be with those people if it wasn't for the oppression? Well, um, you know, like getting the extras, little goodies, like... Yeah, no, I see. I I see your point. Well, you know what? But it goes back to what you were just talking about—that she had very limited or no or or, or no choices. Um, so uh, when you know, when when she was brought over to France, you know, she she didn't have the choice of saying, in back in Virginia, no, I'm not getting on the boat. Um, you know, she did have uh, kind of a fake choice when she was in France, where you know she said that. That, that when she was pregnant, that she was going to stay behind because she wanted to be free, but that wouldn't have made any sense at all. I, uh, and I'm actually, I actually have a hard time believing that she really said that, but uh, that's what her son says. Um, and then that, um, that you know, Jefferson offered offered her this deal: you you come back and be my concubine, and I'll give you what he called extraordinary privileges, and the children will go free. Um, so. Um, and just as, as you as as you outlined, I mean, the, the, she was she was opting for um, a life that was materially, you know, that, that its material conditions much better than she could have had um, either if she stayed in France or if she refused to be his concubine when they got back to Virginia. She would have ended up in the fields, um, and her life would have been even uglier than it was. I think that she must have sat around the mansion for days on end with nothing to do because all she had to do was clean his house, I mean, clean his bedroom. She must have been bored out of her mind. Um, that was not all she was but, doing. Well, I think, uh, that's what her son said, that she only had to do uh, clean his room, uh, just light, you know, light work around the house, that... Um, I don't know if she ever worked in the kitchen or di or worked in the dining room. Her son didn't say that. She was um, also a sexual plaything, right? 
Well, yes, like yeah, there's that. So my yeah. question is, uh, why why would why would we be in this situation if not for white supremacy? That's my question. Like, why would what 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 is the connection between so-called black people and so-called white people if it isn't white supremacy? That's what my question is. I mean, then or now? I mean, right then, now, certainly, right, yeah, right now, now, right now, today. Well, I mean, the, the, but, but you know, black people today certainly have more choices than than slaves did. Um, I mean, there's the freedom of, of movement. I mean, you can go from one part of the country to the other. You don't. Um, and they, I mean, there's. They, 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 I mean, there are too many freedoms for me to even to count. I mean, compared to what what the life of a slave was like. Well, but I'm not. I'm um, not comparing. I'm not comparing. I'm just saying, like, what is the connection between? Because I mean, like you know, the whole terminology of black and white—it's something that was fabricated by racists, white supremacists, and then we're all kind of adhering to these terms, the terms of the racists. So I'm saying, like, what you're saying that there is no system of white supremacy. So I'm asking you, what is what is our relationship to one another, so-called black and so-called white people? Like, what is our relationship if it isn't racism, white supremacy? Well, I hope that in my own personal relationships with black people that I'm not acting out any supremacist role. Um, and, I mean, yeah, it's, I, I think that, you, you know, you would have to tell me. I don't, I, I don't feel that I'm acting as a, as a white supremacist, and I don't want to speak for other whites. Um, as for the whole system being a system of white supremacy, uh, as I've said a couple of times tonight, it's just changed so much. I mean, even even since the 1950s, it's changed so much that uh, there there really isn't any any comparison. Um, I mean, for, for I, when I was writing the Hairston's book, I was amazed to to meet African Americans who were the same age as my parents, and they were not legally allowed to go to school beyond the seventh grade in their own county. Um, but but you know that that was a terrible thing for me to learn. But that that era is over. That's gone. Well, you're, you're, uh, 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 it, it just seems like it's like uh, it's easy to say that from your side, you know, when, from the from the comfortable side. Or, I mean, I suspect you, you know, know what? I, I, I let me let me acknowledge that. I'll, I'll, I'll and I'll guess I'll tell you another story from when I was doing the research for the Hairstons. I I interviewed a man um, who uh, an African American who was. A very successful accountant and businessman, uh, and he lived in what can only be called a mansion in Westchester County, New York. Uh, you, you're from the Bronx. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, he lived in a beautiful 1920s Beaux Arts mansion, beautiful furnishings. Uh, his daughter, uh, you know, had, had, he'd been to college. I think his, his wife had been to college. His daughter had been to college, and she was a teacher at an upscale public school system in Connecticut. And I had a very interesting afternoon talking with him and his wife and daughter about their life stories. And as I was leaving, I said to him, well, you know, it really sounds as if racism has not been a problem or an obstacle for you in your life. And the whole atmosphere of the conversation changed instantly. And he said, it has been an obstacle my entire life. To this day, I am struggling against racism. And his daughter pointed her finger at me, and she looked me right in the eye, and her face changed completely. And she said, you don't see it because it is never directed at you. You have no idea what it's like. So when you're asking me these questions, you're asking me to respond to a force that I will admit is largely invisible to me. I have tried. I mean, I uh, you know I've tried to write about the African American experience, honestly. But in the story that I just told you, you can see how far apart a white person's experience is from an African American's experience. You know, I they tell the story. I hear it. I say, well, racism hasn't been a problem, and they say, are you? Of course it has. So. And the daughter, as I said, was very eloquent. She said, unless it's directed at you, you don't see it. You don't feel it. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to make sure we have time to get to some of the other folks that dialed in. Uh, The person that called from a block number, uh, did you have a question? I want to calm down on the statements as well. Just get your question in so we can see if we can get to as many uh, people that have questions as possible. person that called in from a block number, did you have a question for Mr. Winsack? Uh, Yeah. Hi. Um, To the guests and uh, the callers. Um, I want to ask um, the guest... um, do you think the historians um, don't like to say that um, Sally Hemings was raped by uh, Thomas Jefferson because uh, actually in this country no white man has ever been uh, convicted of raping a black female, and um, I mean, I mean all through you know slavery and Jim Crow, whereas you know lots of black men have been, which I think you know. Um, falsely accused of raping white women. I think it's a very small percentage of white men, of black men to this day who, who have actually raped white women. And I, you know, I just wanted to, wanted to know if you if you think that's the reason why, you know, they don't want to say that about her you know, being raped by him. Well, um, you you could be right. Um, uh, I'll just go back to what I said earlier in the show. I mean, I hate to, I hate to use that really poisonous word. I don't I don't mind if 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 you use it, um, but um, I, I'm I'm really not prepared to go that far. Maybe you can call me a coward, but um, but as I, 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 mean, know, as I, I said mean, before, I mean, go ahead. No, I just want to say because you know. Uh, also, to the Jim, to Jim Crow, you know, South, uh, lots of black women, uh, black females, you know, stated that they had been raped by white men, but no white man had ever been been convicted, you know, of of raping a black female, you know, whereas, I mean, black men were always strung up on trees, you know, for supposedly raping, you know, a white or, t- or touching a white, you know, woman. And I, you know, I'm just wondering if you know they just, you know, don't want to. They don't want to acknowledge that because I, I think it was it was said at one time that uh, why would a a black I mean why would a white man want to rape a nigger when he can you know rape a beautiful white woman I mean, when when he can have sex with with a beautiful white woman that you know that that's that's just what I you know was asking you about. Yeah. That's hard. Right. Well, that's you may. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, you may uh, you may you may be onto something in that in that um, uh, you know white people don't want to you know have any any kind of um, comparison between those two those two acts. But um, I don't know. It's um, it's it's just a very very difficult subject to talk about. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for asking. So thank you for your call. Sure. Thanks. Uh, Lashes, if you had a question for Mr. Winsack, your line should be open. Hi, good evening. I have a quick question. Um, when you were doing your research on this particular case, especially by the words that Madison used in regards to Jefferson and Sally Hemings, what were some of the words you came across used by Madison? You mentioned the word concubine. What other words did you come across? Uh, that's really the most important one that he used to, uh, character, to, to describe the, the relationship. I mean, he, he did say that, um, his mother received extraordinary privileges, and he described those privileges as just being Jefferson's, um, housekeeper doing light work around the house, that she was well used, and that, um, she could have her children with her. And he regarded that as extraordinary. Um, that's um, that's really that's well. You know, if you want, if you go to the Monticello website, Monticello dot org, and search mm-hmm. for Madison Hemings, they have recently put up the complete, accurate text of his um, interview in, from eighteen seventy three, and he tells the whole the, you know the whole story of his family right there. And my next question would be, since you said that you do a lot of research in the early history of the United States, especially during slavery and a little bit past uh, the Civil War, um, I should say Reconstruction era, 
Um, what words were used that were law bounding to describe what we people use the term racism, white supremacy? What words were used then to equate what we use today? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed part of that. What words were used um, to Back describe the, white supremacy? Correct. Back in the 17th, 18th, and 19th like uh, early 19th century to describe what we call racism, white supremacy today? I don't think, um, uh, I'm not quite sure that, uh, I, under I fully understand the question. I'll try to answer it and then you tell me if I'm on the right path. Um, uh, Sometimes, I mean, sl slaveholders would often use the word "negro" as a synonym for slave, and that, and that, that any any black person um, was sort of destined for for slavery. So they had to dis distinguish. So in their minds, black meant slave, uh, and so that's why they had to be careful to say "free Negroes" when when there were fr uh, free people, but. I'm not quite sure what you're what you're getting at when you ask about the words that they use to describe. Okay, what supremacy. synonyms uh, were used to describe racism, white supremacy back then? What synonym What synonyms were used by the slaveholders? Correct. Uh, well, a little bit later. I mean, right in, up before the the, the, the Civil War. I mean, the the, uh, the the southern the leaders of the Confederacy were very explicit about saying that the um, that black people were inferior to whites, and that uh, that uh, the, you know, slavery was was based on on the supremacy of whites over blacks, and that that was the system that had been ordained by God, uh, and that it was that it was perfectly natural. Uh, I don't. I actually. I know. I don't know how much of that they really believed. I think that at at bottom they knew how profitable slavery was, and they were willing to come up with any kind of excuse that they could come up with to justify it. And the word supremacy that you used um, was that mentioned in any law back in those early days as well. In any law, um, well. Uh, a Supreme Court justice said that uh, what was it that the the Constitution did not give uh, Negroes any rights that a white man was bound to respect. So, um, I mean, there's there's one example from the from the law that was from a Supreme Court decision. I think that was from the Dred Scott decision, if I if memory serves. But you have your but you there were, there, there, was, there was a judge in. There was a judge in North Carolina, Judge Ruffin, uh, who uh, who talked about the you know the supremacy of the natural supremacy of of whites over over blacks. Um, so I mean, I think that if you look into legal cases, you'll find a number of of examples of it. I can't think think of any offhand right now, except for the one about uh, the, the you know the, where the Supreme Court justice said that. The, the, the black men didn't have any rights that a white man was bound to respect. Thank you very much. Thank you. A uh, person that called in 9325. 9325, you had a question for Mr. Winsett. Question, questions? Uh, your line should be open. Uh, 9325. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. I can hear greetings, you. Good. Uh, greetings, Mr. Uh, Winsett. And the Thank other you. callers. Okay, Mr. Wansek, uh for eight years, beginning March 4th, 1801, Thomas Jefferson was a chief executive of the world's largest slaveholding nation. 900,000 enslaved Africans in all. 100,000 more than the entire British Empire. My question to you, sir, is uh, what name would you give to a system that established, maintained, supported, and expanded this type of inhumanity and lack of spirituality? 
Well, I, uh, I, I think I, I share your feelings about it. I think it was a slaveocracy. Um, and that the, you know, the government had been taken over by the, the southern states who, ad, who consistently advanced the, the interests of the, of the slaveholders. And they expanded slavery into Louisiana and into Texas. And if they had the chance, they would have uh, invaded Cuba and invaded the Caribbean to establish a, uh, a United States uh, slave states down there. Um, and uh, there's a, a marvelous book called Slave Country, which describes, um, you know, the, 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 the early politics of the country. Another book called The Slaveholding Republic uh, that also describes, um, you know, how the slaveholders ran the country. Um, I don't, uh, a lot of people don't like to accept that. I accept it. I, I think, you know, sl slavery was a much more important part of this, of the founding and early development of this country than most white people are willing to admit. And I think that the story of Jefferson really illustrates that. Uh, I was surprised to find uh, how Jefferson exerted himself to expand slavery into Louisiana when Congress didn't want it there. And a lot of people didn't want it there. They wanted slavery to be put on the road to extinction, but Jefferson expanded it. Thank you, sir. One more quick question. Uh, did Thomas Jefferson make good his promise to Sally Hemings uh, to free her children, taking under consideration that he died uh, in debt about $100,000, and uh, I believe his daughter, uh, question about that, too. She sold the rest of the uh, enslaved Africans, and how could she have done that if women were forbidden to own property during that time? It, it was not his daughter who sold the slaves. Uh, his uh, grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, um, presided over the, the sale. But uh, actually, the sale was carried out by, the, by Thomas Jefferson's estate. I mean, it was the legal entity that actually did the selling. Um, so, uh, and it was, and his daughter, Martha, who was living north of Charlottesville at that time, allowed Sally Hemings to move into the town of Charlottesville, and, and she was still legally a slave, but uh, she was not forced to work anymore. And it's, it was, they used the expression that she was given her time. Um, Jefferson uh, did release his four children that he had with Sally Hemings. He allowed the oldest two, uh, his daughter Harriet and his son Beverly, to run away from Monticello in 1822, uh, and they were not pursued. He actually gave his overseer, he handed his overseer, Edmund Bacon, $50, to give to Harriet to pay for her stagecoach fare north and to give her a little money to get herself started. Um, and then the youngest two sons, Madison and Eston, were set free a year after Jefferson died. They were among the five people who were freed, five men who were freed in Jefferson's will. And Jefferson got special permission from the Virginia legislature to allow those five men to remain in Virginia because according to an 1806 law, if you freed a slave, you had to send that slave out of state unless you got an exemption. And Jefferson got them exemptions from the law. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have time. I want to see if I can sneak in. Uh, last caller, C 0416-0416. Did you have a question for Mr. Winsett? Yeah, I did have a question for Mr. Winsett. Um, when was slavery abolished in New York? Oh, I think, uh, oh, that's, you've, you've caught me out here. I think, um, I think in the late 19, well, the late, late 1700s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I get, I get, oh, no, no, that was in Pennsylvania. I think it was the 1820s in New York. Um, oh, wow. And what was uh, the, the, uh, the northern states had different? You see, Massachusetts and um, uh, Vermont abolished slavery during the Revolution. 
and um, Connecticut, I think, the 1820s, New York, the 1820s, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, the 1790s. But I'm, I'm not sure of those dates. I don't have them all in my head. You can find it, find it online. Okay. What was the, uh, what was white people's reaction? What was the environment like for white people when slavery was abolished in these areas? I, I, I focus on New York because, I mean, when I think of the East Coast, I think of New York. Well, there was, there was an awful lot of racism in New York. I mean, just because the, the northern states uh, passed laws to free their slaves, that doesn't mean that they were very hospitable to black people. I mean, black people faced a lot of, um, of racism, and, uh, you know, early on in the, uh, you know, they had voting rights, which were then taken away from them. Um, and I think that, you know, conditions for blacks, uh, went up and down, and but uh, and I, I think when, when Frederick Douglass moved to Buffalo, he said that he encountered some of the worst racism of his life up there when he moved there after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, one last question: um, Can you you kind of did it just now? But if slavery was abolished in New York in 1820, that's what you said, correct? Uh, that's yes, I off. You know what? I'll open my computer and look it up right now. But go ahead. What's yes? What's your question? Can you uh, compare and contrast 1820 New York to uh, 1965 Mississippi? Oh, you know what? I I really couldn't. I don't I don't know enough about uh, 1820s New York to to say that. I I I know from what from the research that I've done that um, you know. <laughs> Life in New York for blacks in the 1960s was not all that easy, um, but uh, I mean, I mean in Mississippi, life was not easy at all. But I, I don't, I wouldn't make, the, I don't know enough to make the comparison. Oh, okay. Well, then uh, uh, there is. I'm sure that. Um, let me just see. History of slavery in the. Well, here we go. Oh. Uh, well, I guess it says here that in, uh, let's see, well, 1788, the slave trade was, uh, was abolished. Uh, in 1799, the New York legislature passed an act for the gradual abolition of slavery. Um, let's see, I'm not... No, I'm actually not seeing the precise date here. Um, oh, okay. Uh, let's see. There was a law, 1817 law, that gave freedom to New York slaves who had been born before 1799, but not until 1827. So, um, so, but I guess there was some slavery going on until 1841. But legally, slave mo for the most part, slavery ended in New York in the late 1820s. Okay, so people who were allowed to walk off the plantations w were going up north to find a better situation. Well, in the, you mean in the case of, of Jefferson's two sons? Two, I mean, son and daughter? Well, whoever. Well, they went to Washington. Um, uh, people... Some 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 people who left plantations uh, with you know who were freed were you know got exemptions and stayed in Virginia um, and uh, they they were not usually not molested although in the eighteen I mean not bothered by the authorities but in the eighteen fifties right before the Civil War there was a strong movement in Virginia to expel free blacks. And so things got more difficult for black people in Virginia then. Um, but Pennsylvania was a haven for, um, for, for free, free blacks. It was somewhat uh, hospitable. Uh, but, uh, you know, blacks faced difficulty wherever they went. I mean, in Ohio, uh, you know, Jefferson's, uh, Jefferson's son, Madison, faced a lot of racism in the, um, you know, 1850s and 60s and 70s. Uh, it was very difficult for him there, even though Ohio was a free was a free state and he had never had slavery. Okay, so one last question I just want to throw out there: Where did the uh, 
the racist white supremacists in uh, the South in 1965? Where did they get all those tactics from in order to uh, keep the black people down? I mean, you know, it seems like 1965, 1865, 1820, 1777, seems like it's all the same stuff. Rep Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter. Same well, I think actually going, after time. the war, eight, eighteen and eight, you know, when the war and Civil War ended, that things, that that different brands of violence were. Well, I think that they began that the, the you know white people began to use some of the same extremely violent uh, tactics against blacks that they had used against slaves who tried to rebel or or flee. Um, and I mean, the history of Mississippi in the 1860s and 70s is really ugly and violent and very very dark. Um, it it was I, I did some research on that when I was doing Hairston's book. Um, and anybody any black man who was successful enough to have a good farm, you know, would have himself whipped or teachers were murdered, thrown down wells. Um, you know, the women were raped. If you tried to vote, you could get beaten up or killed. Um, it was a very very violent, ugly situation, and that. You know, continued into the twentieth century. Okay, what's your definition of black? Huh, I guess I think you would. Um, my own, de- I don't. I, I I would allow. Uh, I I would allow the other person to define him or herself as as black, um, because I you know I know people of. I, I know people who have whose skin is the same color as mine, which is very light, and they identify themselves as black. So I refer to them in conversation as a black person. It's however the person wants to define himself or herself. Okay. Well, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm a UVA alumnus. Can you uh, spare me uh, so we can get our last caller in? Uh, we had people that dialed in late is that acceptable mr winsack sure sure cool uh not uh six three six nine caller at six three six nine did you have a question for mr winsack six three six nine did you have a question still not hearing oh okay they hung up i assume that they are just listening uh since they hung up i will get in uh See if we can get in my last question. Um, this is on page 55. Um, and I wanted to bring this up just because that was one of the themes that I got when reading the book, the consistency. Uh, I think even our last caller, Dr. Trav, um, many patterns. You're writing about things that happened towards the end of the 18th century, 19th century, and just seeing a lot of similar patterns with regards to things that white people who practice racism, white supremacy, things that they do, things that they say, things that they believe in. On page 55, uh, you write that right after a complex sentence concerning the structure in the pulmonary apparatus that makes blacks radically different from whites, Jefferson continues abruptly. They are at least as brave and more adventuresome. Perhaps he might have glimpsed one of the slaves who had lately risked his life on his behalf facing down the British at Monticello. Further on he writes, we find among them numerous instances of the most rigid integrity of benevolence, gratitude, and unshaken fidelity. In these fleeting phrases he seems to acknowledge the humanity of the people and to stress it for the reader. We get the sense that there is more to this world than Jefferson's philosophy. His prediction that ten that 10,000 recollections of injustice would provoke a race war flew in the face of the unshaken fidelity he had recently experienced. Despite widespread fear among the slaveholders, no up- uprisings had materialized during the revolution. Major pattern that I have observed white people, even Douglas Blackman, he was talking about that last week when I heard him up here. Uh, this uh, irrational fear uh, on the part of whites that seems to be a, a, a an undying fear that black people are going to revolt and slaughter them, kill them, rape them. Uh, this seems to be a long running thread uh, that Jefferson expressed, even when there's no evidence to support it. Uh, Jefferson was saying this way before 
Nat Turner had happened and, and other incidents. I even heard uh, white people alleging that white uh, that black people were going to riot if President Obama lost the election just a few months back. Uh, what is your view on why this seems to be such an enduring concern for white people, the uprising of dark people? I think that it goes back to a, an old, um, a primitive fear in white people, of, 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 of northern European white people, of being overwhelmed by outsiders, and especially being overwhelmed by darker-skinned people. I think that there is some kind of genetic fear of it, and Jefferson expresses it very well. Uh, and so they, they, they exaggerate the, they, this fear, these fears in their minds to the point of paranoia, and, and they, in, they invent dangers where there aren't any. As you know, one of your earlier callers said, um, you know, white men were consistently raping you know, black women, and yet, it's you know, it's it's the the fear of of rape that white people keep raising about about black men, and it, it you know, and it rarely rarely happened. Um, and the other thing that's important to mention about that passage that you just read is that um, it just shows how in slavery and afterwards, it didn't. If you were black, it didn't matter how loyal you were, how brave you were, how much you had done for a white person. It it didn't change your situation. I mean, you were still held a slave. I mean, in a few limited situations it would, but, you know, you were still regarded as inferior and as a slave. And that's one of the, the really ugly, painful things about slavery is the sense that it was drilled into enslaved people that it, it didn't matter what you did. It, that It didn't matter. Blood ties didn't matter. Loyalty didn't matter. Courage didn't matter you would always be a slave because that other guy was in charge. He made the decision and he was not about to let you go. Did I hear that uh, correctly? You said uh, a genetic fear on the part of white people? I think so. I mean, it's so consistent um, that, and, and, you know, I mentioned this in one of my footnotes that um, you see it in movies a lot, uh, you know, and, and I think that that's why um, incidents in American history like the Alamo and Custer's Last Stand have resonated and so large in the white imagination because in both cases they are small groups of white men who are overwhelmed by people who are of a different race. And in, in, in the case of the Alamo, it's Mexicans who are are you know are are largely usually perceived as white, but we're you know slightly they're you know they're Catholic, so they're different in that way. But they're slightly darker skinned. They're Hispanic people, and it's a, it ties into that fear of the small number of embattled whites being overwhelmed by a horde from outside. And I think it's the same thing with the um, Custer's Last Stand. That small group of white men overwhelmed and annihilated by a tide of of red men. Um, and Jefferson evoked that fear in notes in the state of Virginia. Um, you know, there was an interesting article a number of years ago in the New York Times book review on the anniversary of the War of the Worlds broadcast in 1938. And what that broadcast was, you know, was based on the H.G. Wells novel about an invasion of Earth from Mars, you know, by these foreign creatures who were completely different from us. And this, the, the author had an interesting theory in that he said the reason that it touched off such panic among people is that humans had this, you know, especially white people had the sense, oh boy, now it's our turn. We're going to be colonized. We're going to be, you know, raped and attacked and annihilated. Uh, and and a, a greater power is going to do to us what we have been doing to the lesser, the people we regarded as lesser people all over the world. Um, so anyway, that's uh, it's just my my my, my sense that uh, there, there's almost. I mean, it, it may very well be genetic that that the northern Europeans are remembering, you know, the invasion of the Mongols from centuries ago or something like that. Fasc you know, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's all right. No, that's 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 all I had to say. Hmm. I I might have missed it. Um, I said when I was asking the question that 
uh, Jefferson made this statement that I just read uh, or paraphrasing from. Uh, he made this. This is well in advance of, of Nat Turner doing his thing down in Virginia. Uh, but uh, the Haitian Revolution was a pretty big deal uh, around this time. I didn't uh, see that pop up in your book at all. And that seems like that would fit pretty closely with something that would strike if that genetic fear of dark people is present in white people. That seems like that would be a pretty significant event and something that would have weighed heavily on the mind of, I know it weighed heavily on the mind of uh, white slaveholders in the South, white people worldwide. Uh, what happened in Haiti, that didn't pop up in your book at all, did it? Did I miss that? No, and well, uh, it, 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 for the main reason was um, I only write about things that I have I've, uh, that, that I that I've had the chance to research do do to, to research myself in the primary sources in great depth. I didn't have the time to research the Haitian Revolution in any depth, and I didn't want to rely on secondary sources. Um, and I know it was, it was it was very important. And my editor talked to me about putting in a section about it. And I said, you know, I also I want to stick close to Monticello. I want to keep the focus on Monticello as much as possible. Um, Jefferson did undermine the Haitian Revolution. The Federalists that came before him, John, the Adams administration supported the Haitian Revolution, um, but Jefferson cut the legs out from under it. Um, he did not want to see a successful revolution. Um, and you know, certainly there was great, you know, horrible violence in it. But I mean, if Jefferson had decided to throw his weight behind this revolution for human liberty, then uh, things would have gone would have gone better. And well, of course, he he knows that it would have undermined slavery. He knew it would have undermined slavery in the South. There would there would have been no question. And so he he didn't he didn't want to do anything that would weaken the institution of slavery. Hmm. Okay, right on. I know that uh, Mr. Jefferson, he did write about, uh, talked about what was going on uh, in in Haiti uh, during that time period that I think would fit right in line. Cool. Um, again, Mr. Henry Winsek, you can check his website, uh, henrywinsek.wordpress.com, uh, henrywinsek.wordpress.com. He has also written uh, The World of Lego toys, which is fascinating. I don't know how you go from founding fathers to Lego. Did you see the recent uh, report where people were accusing uh, Lego of being racist with some of their new toy lines? No, I didn't. I didn't see that. Um, I looked that up. I would. Um, the Danes are very sensitive uh, people. I. I don't. I can't imagine that they would do something that was deliberately insulting. But I'll, I'll have to look that up. That's news to me. Uh, I was just. Uh, pretty big news uh in january uh it's on huffington it's on quite a few places you can check it out christian science monitor huffington post uh where they talked about it but it's january of this year uh where people were offended oh, by okay. I'll take a look at it. star wars line uh henry winsek thoroughly enjoyed the dialogue learned quite a bit thank you for sharing a bit of your time with us uh, i think i'm actually going to get uh the harristons and read that as well maybe we can have you back to discuss that work i think Annette Gordon Reed, she had great things to say about that book. So if you're willing, uh, we'll be looking forward to having you back on the program down the road. Sure, I'd love to talk about that. Outstanding. It would be, uh, be very enjoyable. Context of White Supremacy, our guest for the evening, uh, Mr. Henry Winsek. Thank you so much. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, we will be in touch with you soon, sir. Take excellent care. Great. Thank you, Gus. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Have a good evening. Okay, same to you. Good night. Yes, sir context of white supremacy fascinating fascinating big welsing moment at the end there i think 1804 she would appreciate the uh, commentary on the haitian revolution as well we will take a quick commercial break and we'll be back if anybody has any closing thoughts they want to get in uh, before we wrap things up uh, context of white supremacy RacismDaily.com, your number one source for global news reports on race, racism, and overt actions of white supremacy. From Asia to the Americas to Europe to Australia to Africa, racism is not a thing of the past. It is our current reality. Be informed. Be globally informed. You should be the first to know. RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com. Is racism hurting you? 
On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? At counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Do you need a one-stop shop for all of your multimedia needs? Triumphant Multimedia is a skilled team of professionals with a passion for great marketing and chic design. Our specialties include consulting, brand development, copywriting, and creative graphic design. That's second to none. We also offer photography, photo retouching, videography, and video editing. At Triumphant Multimedia, our goal is to provide highly effective creative solutions built to suit any individual need or budget. Give us a call at 678-732-8067 or check us out online at TRI Multimedia. Multimedia.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is Justice with the Cows Radio program. If you want to learn about, understand, and counter racism, white supremacy, be sure not to miss a cow's episode. We keep them jammed, packed with constructive information to sharpen your use of words to help eliminate the system of racism, white supremacy, ASAP. Also, to be able to invest in my counter-racist efforts co-hosting the cow's radio program, please visit my blog, just to justicetoday.blogspot.com. You're just saying just buckets and buckets of words. I got an uncle real crazy. My uncle B, 55 years old, hates white people, married to a white lady. <laughs> and he's sitting around going, you know, these crackers ain't shit. Except for Susan. <laughs> he tried to explain the whole thing to me one day, say, yeah, 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 I got a white wife, I love her, she love me, that's all that matter. But I tell you this, if the revolution ever come, I kill her first. <laughs> Just to show these crackers I mean business. <laughs> motherfucker cracker ass, motherfucker cracker. She cracker motherfucker. What? Hey, hey, hi, honey. <laughs> motherfucker cracker. I'll kill my cracker kids too. <laughs> Context of white supremacy. We'll be back tomorrow. Sixth installment. Warriors don't cry. Melba Patillo Beals, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, back to our regular program time. Uh, uh, I guess number one, I did want to mention uh, the female caller who said that a white man had not been convicted for raping a black female. Uh, that is not true. A white man has been convicted for raping a black female, although it does not happen very often, uh, which really just reinforces the point that she was making. Uh, and it did not happen until very recently, uh, up until I think like 1960 or so. I think that was the first time it happened. Uh, it had not happened at all. But uh, it, it really just reinforces her point, just trying to make sure I'm not uh, giving out inaccurate information. But her overall point was absolutely on the money, just... It wouldn't that wouldn't be the accurate way to say it that a white man has never been convicted of raping a black female but it hardly ever happens under the system of white supremacy um, in the same vein uh, the caller in the Bronx he brought up the tweet about uh, Quavinjane Wallace uh, she was nominated for an Academy Award for Beasts of the Southern Wild and uh, she will be uh, 
one of the stars in 12 Years a Slave uh, coming to theaters this September. Uh, this is from the theguardian.co.uk. Uh, their post on this, The Onion's apology for its Quavenjane Wallace tweet. Well, this is awkward. Uh, they write, Cunt is an interesting word. I like it. It packs a lot of invective into one syllable and four letters. It's so powerful that the Guardian style guide says I can only use it surrounded by the protective pincers of quote marks. It's magnificently unpleasant, like a full grown tiger. And like a full grown tiger, I wouldn't let the C word loose on a nine year old child, which is what the onion did in an ex inexplicable Oscar Knight tweet, now heartily retracted and apologized for. Everyone else seems afraid to say it, but that Quavenjane Wallace seems kind of a cunt, right? Oh, this was the exact tweet. They went ahead and gave it to you. So the exact tweet that they said, everyone else seems afraid to say it, but that Quavenjane Wallace seems kind of a cunt, right? After I had the best part of a day to consider, I think I sort of get how this joke was maybe supposed to work. The Onion was satirizing the crassest sort of gossip hack, the kind of tattler who calls actresses hoes and draws spunking cocks on their faces. There are two problems with that explanation, if it's even right. First, that it took me from when I first read the tweet just after I woke up until dinner time to hit on that reasoning and compared with the Mayfly life cycle of Twitter, that's enough time for mountains to rise up and ground to, and to be ground to dust. The second problem is that even if the gag was meant to be a critique of celeb hounding pop culture, hey, wouldn't it be exactly like a scandal sheet writer to call a nine year old a cunt? The Onion was still the one actually calling a nine year old a cunt. And in American English, cunt has a particularly sexualized intent that makes it even more horrific when applied to a child. Call someone a cunt and you're calling them a vagina in a most reductive, misogynistic way. There's something weak, something to be penetrated. How do I know that? Satire taught me specifically the episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm where Larry unknowingly aims the C-word at a gay man. Consider that this happened in an evening when the Oscar host Seth MacFarlane cracked a gag that cast George Clooney as Humpert to Wallace's unwitting Lolita and it starts to look less like a baffling lapse and more like fraternity Hollywood asserting itself over a small black child. You can act, the jokes imply, you can even be brilliant as Wallace is in Beasts of the Southern Wild. You can be as cute as you like in your beautiful dress and your puppy dog handbag and we the Hollywood fraternity reserve the right to remind you that you are nothing but female heading for a future where six years from now paps aim a long lens up your skirt and everyone calls you a slut because you didn't take the precaution of binding your legs together before getting out of the car. When a particularly absurd headline comes up, it's routine to say that it could have come from The Onion. Because the site's deadpan imitation of news hyperbole and prosaic life is so dead on. This time there was no space between the imitation and the real thing for laughter to fall in. That's one of the perils of parody. Becoming what you were just pretending to be at first but it's a peril that The Onion has dodged with amazing success in its first 25 years. Without explicitly espousing any political line or making any outright pronouncements, The Onion offered an implicit guarantee that laughing at its jokes might cause you a bit of uncomfortable self-awareness, but would never make you a bad person. Often that's because, like most good satire, the jokes have several sides to offer. Donald Trump stares forlornly at tiny aged penis in mirror before putting on clothes beginning day starts out as a savage pillory of the business magnet and his genitals hmm. but morphs into an oddly tender discourse on human decrepitude you started reading because you hated Trump you ended up feeling dimly sorry for him see you're not a monster and 
you're also not Trump. So that's a double win. But there's no good side to laughing at a sexualized insult aimed at an elementary schooler. If that's what you get, if that's where you get your laws, you're probably a supporting character in an episode of Law and Order Special Victims Unit rather than an upstanding member of a politely ironic society, which is why it's right that The Onion has said sorry and distanced itself from the C-word tweet. The statement has done a lot to quell readers' anger, and I respect the editorial decision to make it. That's the last problem, though. By getting something so wrong, The Onion has had to state what it genuinely thinks is right, and being unambivalent is an awkward and ungainly circumstance for any satire to him himself into. End of the report. Uh, again, that's from The Guardian. The Onion's apology for its Quavingene Wallace tweet. Well, this is awkward. Uh, this was published on Tuesday, February 26th. Hmm. They did not accuse them of being racist. Hmm. At any rate, uh, if anybody has anything they want to share before we wrap up, I would prefer to uh, go ahead and close things out, but uh, or at least not to be here for the full three hours. But if anyone has anything they want to share before we wrap up, uh, I will read this one quick line from uh, Mr. Winsek's uh, book, Master of the Mountain. Uh, this is on page 47. Uh, just always good to get this out so that we have a clear understanding of what's going on and you can see same thing that I was saying kind of regularly during the program this evening the consistency with regards to the trifling antics of white people doesn't matter if you're talking 18th century 21st century patterns uh, he writes this is on page 47 Jefferson said that white people's flowing hair and more elegant symmetry of form made them more sexually attractive than blacks. He claimed that all blacks lusted after whites. In triumphant proof, he wrote the ill-famed phrase that black people seek sex with white people as uniformly as is the preference for the Arunatan for the black woman over those of his own species. Jefferson had extracted this tidbit from Buffon's report, Buffon, excuse me, Buffon's report of travelers' accounts of apes kidnapping and raping African women. Jefferson probably summoned up the fantastical image of an ape mating with an African woman to deflect attention from the actual reality of Virginia society, the pervasive rape of black women by white men. Uh, this is page 47 master of the mountain I will wrap there uh, before I hit the uh, phone line see if folks are there uh, I generally do not get very disgruntled uh, about white people uh, particularly when on the program or really anytime when I'm talking to them about racism uh, I generally don't have much of a emotional response about it in terms of being disgruntled angry offended um, I really don't care <laughs> for the most part just trying to keep it pushing uh, even at the beginning of the program he said he was I think the word he used was he was reluctant to label Thomas Jefferson a rapist and he couldn't explain why uh, that sort of thing I generally I really don't care uh, particularly if it's recorded fantastic a plus everybody heard that we can just keep it pushing and get to uh, the other material uh, but uh, our, one of our investors black he's been on the program uh, twice actually uh, in the archives talking about depression and other topics uh, he was very appreciative uh, Bruce Vaughn and some of our other callers for calling in to voice their displeasure uh, with uh, Mr. Winsek uh, referencing white slave masters Mr. Jefferson and others as uh, our relatives and or Sally Hemings cutting a deal uh, or being calculating uh, in whatever decision she made as a victim of racism. Uh, I wanted to make sure I got that in as well. Anywho, uh, caller in the Bronx, your line should be open. Uh, 9325, you should be with us. Uh, caller from a blocked number. And Princess, uh, you should all be with us if you all had anything you wanted to share before uh, we wrap things up. Hey, can I be here? Yes, sir. Great. Uh, um, yeah, I would suggest uh, if anyone the the, the the Onion made a movie 
couple years ago, and it's really interesting if you look at it with the um, RWSWJ, you know, mindset. I mean, you'll see a lot in that movie. Um, and uh, another movie I was just thinking about was um, uh, uh, Fame. Like, I went to performing arts high school out here in New York City, and Fame was a movie in the 70s um, about that high school. And uh, very, very, you know, I don't know. If anyone's seen it, it's a classic, but um, there's a scene in it that's just like, like it's like burned into my mind, just a uh, sexual sewering of black people. But um, this thing I was thinking was um, was that uh, you know, the the guest gave a lot of information, and I think that's that's really like Gus's standpoint is a, is a is an accurate um one, just like you know, we're in a system of white supremacy, so if that's the conclusion you've come to, then, you know, I mean, that, that, that's, you know, good, you know, um, if you think that that's accurate. But, I mean, just take the information as for what it is, because that's what white people, it's like, he just kind of gave out information for the sake of information, and he just kind of got super soft on the, uh, on the conclusions. So I conclude that he, you know, he could be a racist. He's probably practicing racism, white supremacy. Um, but yeah, just you know, get the information and and come up with your own conclusions. You know. Can I be heard? No. Yeah. Hey, this is um, Princess, and um, I I'd just like to say um, for Bruce Fawn, I I appreciate her asking the question because. I actually had four questions, and that was one of them, uh, but I crossed it off because I didn't want to get emotional either because I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've heard people say that about victims, um, you know, young victims of child molestation and stuff like that, and it's, it's, it's just all the same thing, and, you know, as he was describing, you know, giving gifts, you know, giving her material possessions and stuff like that, I just couldn't help but think about how these sexual predators uh, groom these kids, uh, you know, before they, you know, take advantage of them. And, you know, my, my phrase now is just, you know, grooming slaves for sexual ex exploitation. I mean, I, I don't understand how um, white people can articulate or even... Um, romanticize about having a, a relationship or having love for a slave. I mean, how do you love a slave? Yeah, that, that, that makes no sense. But, you know, like the caller in um, New York said, you know, take it face value because that that's what they're about. And um, I just wanted to thank um, Bruce Fine for asking the question or giving the commentary nonetheless because... Um, I, I purposely had to avoid it because I would have gotten myself upset. Oh uh, yeah, I just want to make a comment. Um, uh, several years ago, on the Oprah, Win it was Oprah Winfrey uh, program, and um, there was all these light, very light skinned black people on there, and they they said they were all. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's um, relatives, uh, the, de the descendants of him, and they were fighting uh, a civil suit to get uh, for their people, for their family members to get to get buried in uh, Monticello's graveyard or cemetery or whatever. And I just thought that was so stupid. I, I mean, like, I mean, the, the man was clearly racist and. And you, I mean, you could you could look at all these people and tell that they particularly uh, all, only um, sexed with light skinned people because they, they didn't want any dark skin in, in their families and and stuff. And you know they were just really making a big deal about that how they want their people to get buried in you know Thomas you know Jefferson's cemetery you know and stuff. And I I just thought it was so stupid. I've seen that. I've seen that. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. I graduated from UVA, <laughs> I've, uh, and I was born in Virginia, so I've seen quite a bit of that in my lifetime. And the, they have brawled and argued over this. The white people said they didn't want the niggas there, and blah blah blah. Yeah. It's long, trifling history. You don't sound like you're from Virginia. Thank God. <laughs> I remember you said it a while back, and I, I was like, he's from Virginia? Like, what? <laughs> wow. Is anybody on the uh, line now? Has anybody read uh, Annette Gordon-Reed? Like, uh read any of her books on Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings, anyone? No. 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 Mm. Mm. I'm aware of, uh, well, we've had some on the program, uh, un- well, I won't say, un- they're victims, they're victims, I'm a victim, we're all victims. Uh, Millie McGee, she was, uh, on the program in 2009, and, uh, she wrote well she's written several things one she's written about j edgar hoover being uh one of her relatives same thing she's written about him being one of her relatives and all that we discussed that when she was on the program uh but she also wrote a novel about a quote-unquote romance between a slave owner racist and a slave and uh yeah it was i don't even know what to say it's standard i guess that's that's it's standard. Uh, when you hear people talk about these tragic arrangements on the plantation, that's generally the way it goes. You, I, I think other than Dr. Jensen, uh, maybe Mr. Fuller, a few other folks, uh, it, whether it's a white person or a non-white person, it tends to be, this is uh, Romeo and Juliet. This is some sort of, of tragic and, and difficult relationship, and they were just under difficult circumstances, but love finds a way. Even with shackles, love will find a way. Uh, that's generally the way it is presented, uh, even frequently with a lot of black people, unfortunately, which is, again, we are victims of racism. Uh, I am here that... I had been trying to get Annette Gordon Reed on the program before she's a black female. I had been trying to get her on the program uh before, uh, but she was super busy and trying to get things. I would love to get her on to uh talk about her work and what she thought about Mr. Winsex's work. Uh I did not have the impression that she was depicting Sally Hemings as being I guess how would I phrase it? Being and having some sort of control and uh, using sex to get better outcomes for herself, presenting it as though she was something other than a victim of racism uh, in a really horrific terroristic circumstance. That was not my impression, but uh, I would love to go back and take a second look and and talk to her directly to see what she says. Um, I was I think I was typing to somebody during the program that I'm I'm pretty much in agreement with the stance about agency what he was saying the whole trend and it's it's not just her i I can't speak directly for her but i know that is a big trend uh if you take any college classes or you talk to any white people in the academy and even a lot of non-white people victims of racism they will uh use that word it's like a buzzword you got to find agency you got to talk about agency and these black people were resisting and they were doing things to fight back which is all true i have no problem with talking about different things that uh black people slaves did to resist but i think it's it's very important to keep in mind these folks are victims uh that these folks are in a terrible position and that they have a lot less power than the white slave owners and that all of their choices whatever they're doing even if they're resisting all of that is in response to uh and under the domination of white people uh, i think that's really important to not try to minimize that and act like it ain't so uh so yeah i'll be looking forward to checking that out hopefully we can get on the program if not maybe we can make that a book club um one of our book club sessions because i think that would be important I think also, too, towards the end, he was, um, he made mention talking about what white people have been perpetrating worldwide um, for centuries, and, you know, when he was talking about H.G. Wells, and I was just like, well, would it be, you know, so hard for you to just take it one step further and say that what 
which our ancestors have done back then or is still being perpetrated worldwide today. I, I didn't understand. I did, but... Yeah, that's, that's, that's the same thing I thing where I fell too. I feel like this this man is supposed to have so much intelligence, but he he act like he cannot see the connection between racism then and that, you know, and how racism racism is now, you know, mm-hmm. because just like that book that uh um that man wrote, slavery by a by another name, it's just that a continu lesson. it's just a continuing uh. Of, of what it's like now, you know, with the prison slave system, you know, with, and he and he act like you know he 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 didn't re, you know he didn't know that you know I mean he or he didn't want to talk about how the prison system now is the same as in that book and and stuff. I don't know if he, if he was just playing dumb or he was just you know <laughs> or he didn't know any you know these things or what. I think he was just playing dumb. Because when I said something about, you know, about a white man not wanting to rape a nigger, you know, I could tell he was offended. He said, I don't want to talk about it. (laughs) If anyone is ignorant about racism, it's black people. Black people. Black people. 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 I know he's not ignorant. I know he was just pretending. Hmm. (laughs) Can I be heard? Yes. Um, I recall um, Oprah doing an episode um, where the different celebrities uh, came on and uh, they found out that uh, they had white people, slave owners in their um, uh, uh, family tree or whatever. (laughs) Family tree, but anyway. Um, Emmett Smith, football player Emmett Smith was on there and this white guy took him down to the archives um, where they keep the archives and and the white guy kept calling the slave owner Emmett Smith's great great grandfather or something. Oh, he was your great great grandfather you know and uh, Emmett Smith said well um, I don't have any of, of, of his ways or whatever in me and I noticed that white people more and more are referring to these racist rapists as our relatives, but yet when white people talk about their ancestors, they are calling them they and them, they back then, them back then. They don't, uh, they divorce themselves from the, uh, horrible acts of their ancestors, but then they want to link them up as being our relatives. And there was a a, a cover that came out, I think, yesterday, the day before, of this white girl uh, in blackface on a uh, magazine cover. I think it's called um, African Queen or something like that. <laughs> and it's like white people are saying, while, while saying that black people are related to all of these white people, they are now coming out more and more like the guest did tonight. Uh, I, I may be white. I'm not sure. I could be. I have some more in me. Uh, they are now trying to say that they are the black people. And um, I think we need to really put, pay close attention to that, and they're doing that for a reason, I, I feel a very deliberate, uh, racist reason. They're going to say, we are the white people and they are the black people. And that's when black people will get reparations, uh, when white people become black people. What was the uh, program where uh, Emmett Smith was on and they were they were talking about his uh, quote? It was, it, it was on Oprah, um, Probably like about four or five years before she um, left the air. And I think it was one of those type of like Ancestry.com shows and trying to 
uh, let black people know how much, uh, how many white people uh, were in our, uh, you know, background or whatever. But but speaking of them, like the guy was tonight, uh, relative, like we, that's something to be proud of or, or uh, th- that was your great, great, great grandfather. Yeah. I found it. But they don't refer to them as their grandfathers. They call them they and them. I don't think they would do that if a black person was to raise their daughters and, you know, have offspring and generation later, you know, Mm. be proud of your grandfather. Exactly. (laughs) It's it's deliberate. They're, They're just trying to divorce themselves, not from the benefits, not from the practice, but Again, like um, Princess, I think, said earlier, romanticizing uh, their brutality, their inhumanity. I don't know. He just kept on going on about, you know, material possessions, like, that's mm-hmm. all we we worry about, and I'm like, you can't make a decision about you know whether or not you want to be with this uh, rapist versus your children and stuff. What decision do you have? You're you're a slave, and it's like the whole time he's just talking about material possessions that she would have been afforded her, and you know how you know well she only had to do light cleaning. You know she served her time, and you know. She was able to retire, and, you know, she cleaned up his room. And, you know, that, it just reminded me of, like, the, uh, what's the name of the killer that they, or uh, the, the killer or rapist, uh, the BT, B, BTK or something. Mm-hmm. That, that, yeah, the, the guy with, you know, raping and harboring all these women. No, 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 not Dominique uh, Strauss-Kahn. It, it was the BTK killer. He he would kidnap uh, these women, bond them. Uh, oh, BTK, bond, torture, uh, and kill them. And basically, he was just for. I think it went on for about twenty or twenty five years. I forgot how many women. But you know, just you know, it's it's just crazy. Racist. Yes. This is so and we cool. Supposed to, we, and we supposed to worship that. We supposed to, you know, that's why I say, I, I, I've never stood for the Pledge of Allegiance. I used to get in trouble about that all the time. But, you know, it's not saying that, you know, you know, I'm big in that. But I, I just had a fundamental, I don't know why, where it came from, but I just never participated in doing that. I, I'm not saluting. Uh, a bunch of people that I know as I've gotten older, like like you guys said, rapists and, you know, racists, this, that, and other. I've never gone to any football games or anything like that. I, I, I avoid things like that where I would have to do that. Mm-hmm. And if I was somewhere, you know, I'd just sit down. If somebody asked me, is there something wrong, I'd tell them. I don't feel, I don't believe in uh, what it stands for. And, 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 and for him to, to, you know, say that Sally was calculating and like she was uh, some, yes. like she was some hot and tight prostitute whore. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 then we, and then saying, you know, this power that she had over him. She had power over him. Um, you know, it's, it's, and, and. It's that this dehumanizing black people, and regardless of what white people do, you are supposed to identify with them and see them as human. 
You know, it's a, it's amazing that white people have all kinds of psych, psychology talking about the effects of things, uh, the psychological effects of things that happen to you. If a white person stumps his toe and he goes out there and he shoots up 77 people, you know, oh, it's the psychological effect of stumping the toe. But yet, the things that we do, even if black people say, you know, have these romantic uh, uh, delusions or whatever as a result of slavery, these romantic delusions about the slave master or what have you, white people never say, well, that's a, a, a psychological effect of 500 years of brain trashing. No, it's no, none of that. It's uh, they were being we're being calculating and we didn't mind we you know it's, it's real love it's true love you know yeah. we don't we don't get afforded any um, psychological effects they never talk about the psychological effects because they know they'll be indicted one hundred percent guilty 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 all day every day. I, I was talking about the terminology of like black and white, and just how uh, how like you know how fundamental that is to the world we live in now, and uh, it's just like we, we we never we never had a choice in the matter from the beginning, mm. and and then it continued in that same thing, and and here we are still. You know, talking about we're black and stuff like that, and it's like right. we never really had a chance. I found the. And, uh, and I bo- oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, I was just gonna say he he said something about. Um, uh, I think one of the callers asked him what was his definition of of a black person or black people or something or or black, and he said that he lets. Black people uh, call ourselves what we what we want to. Something to that effect. Even if it's someone who's as light as he is, or something. Uh, real quick, uh, I found the uh, report Bruce Fine mentioned, or. I found the video. This is actually two separate things. I found the video with Emmett Smith being on Oprah talking about all this. Uh, I'll put it on my Facebook page once all this wraps up. Uh, I'll tweet it as well. Uh, but CNN also covered this as well. That right there just stands out as suspicious that white people spend a lot of time and energy focusing on this. That CNN did a report on it. it was on, I mean, just Oprah enough would be more than enough but fact CNN yeah. also covered this and looks like some other white people as well major mainstream uh, media outlets but the CNN report they wrote uh, I'm not reading the whole thing I'm just uh, a couple paragraphs it says Emmett Smith Emmett Smith, uh, Emmett Smith says the family history he unearthed in book 22 shook him to the core John helped him find a property deed stating that Mariah was transferred from Samuel to his son Alexander Samuel probably had her bred, John says. Then when she got old enough, he gave her to his son. They raised and bred horses and raised and bred slaves. In other words, the horses were more important than any slaves that they ever had, Emmett says. They treated my people like animals, but worse than animals. The deed stated that Mariah was passed down along with a horse, bridle, and a saddle. She was such a young woman, and it says, I have a 13-year-old daughter right now, and I have a 10-year-old daughter right now. I couldn't imagine them being passed down through slavery that way, much less engaged in sexual intercourse with a 40-year-old. Uh, Professor Stephen Dale, I hope I'm saying this right, Professor Stephen De- Dale, Dale, a domestic slave trade historian, says it's safe to assume that Samuel was, in fact, Mariah's father. Alexander was engaged in this horrible horrible traffic and why he didn't sell Mariah is because he recognized Mariah as his sister Stephen says there you go with the familiar everything you all talked about the word bread the familial ties the whole nine they don't call it rape mm-hmm. the whole nine 
Mm-hmm. Oh, you can read this. This is on CNN. Uh, Emmett Smith's family tree has uh, slaves, slave owner. Uh, it's from April 5th, 2010. It's on CNN. Family tree. Family. <laughs> wow. Mm. Yeah. All in the family. But again, they divorced themselves from those white people. They, them, those back then. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So we're supposed to have a soul tied to them. <laughs> yeah. And you're you're right. It's, it seems like they're they're coming out with these stories more and more, trying to make them um, more personable, and you know to soften the look of the the rapists, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Be like, oh, you you don't know that you you may have some white in you too. Like that that's a good thing. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I think even that's exaggerated when you you hear, uh, and and unfortunately, black people repeat lies told by white people that every single. Uh, one of our enslaved ancestors, enslaved by white people, uh, uh, has, uh, has some white in them. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think that is so exaggerated. Very true. But, I was going to ask you, um, when I sent you um, uh the uh, gift on Amazon. I sent you uh, another book, but I didn't realize that um, I actually already have the movie to Solomon um, Northrop, and I also have the movie. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, a woman called Moses. I haven't. I was going to try and upload it on my own thing, but I've been having some trouble. Either that, or I'm confused. But I'll figure it out. But I was just letting you know that I also had the movie to it, too. So uh, I'll try and get it up so everybody will be able to have it downloaded and stuff. Um, yeah, I was going to say also the book by James Baldwin called Go Tell It on the Mountain is an excellent read. And I also have that movie. And that movie oh, okay. Is oh, a Woman Called Moses? No, it's called um, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Oh, okay. James Baldwin. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think that that'd be a, a a really good read for 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 the book club as well. Okay. That's, did he say something about uh, white people have flashbacks from when the Mongols uh, invaded them or something like that? Yep, he said that was a part of the. Uh, genetic memory uh, or the genetic component of white people's fear of the rising tide of dark people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he kept using that term dark a lot. Like, it was a dark time and, you know, he had a, you know, he had a dark life and all like you know, that. It's associated with... Uh, a lot of the articles, some of the articles, like when I was saying at the beginning that uh, he did an interview on MSNBC towards the end of 2012 with Ture and there's a lot of white people too. But uh, if you look for it online, it's, it's they titled like the dark history of Thomas Jefferson. And if you look at like the reviews for his book uh, and even some of the when like Annette Gordon Reed and other people are talking about uh, his book, that's frequently the way they put it, uh, the, the dark controversy around Thomas Jefferson and dark this mm-hmm. and dark that they consistently using uh, those words uh, very important pattern it looks like a woman called Moses might be online already um, in case you want to save some time I'm checking it looks like it's in parts so I don't know but if it's if it's already online you might want to save uh, invest your time in something more constructive I will I'll double check to make sure I'm not telling people something wrong but it looks like it might be online yeah, because oh. I saw that movie, and they made it sound like the abolitionists, you know, they were really, you know, nice, and, and they were good to the black people, and they helped them get into Canada, and they were, you know, just really, really warm and wonderful. 
You know, that's that's the part I didn't like about it. Oh, it's long. It's like three hours. Wow. It, yeah, it is a real long movie. I'm sure I haven't seen it, but Cicely Tyson's and it. it looks like, you know, I trust you all's judgment, so it looks like it's probably worth it, but I didn't know it was three hours. So it's probably in a lot of parts. I'll see if I can find it where it's one. Where it's you talking about a woman called Moses? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. It, it's a real good movie. It's, it's, it's definitely something. It's actually, I, I like that movie better. Well, I like all of them, but I, I tend, I gravitated towards that movie more. Because it, it has a lot of, <laughs> a lot of teachable uh, points about white supremacy, big time. Yeah. But yeah, it, 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 it's um, divided, I believe, in three parts. Yeah, she was also at Miss Jane, uh, Miss Jane Pittman, and that that was a really, really long movie. <laughs> movie. Mm hmm Yeah. That was a good one I'm, too. I'm curious to know the when uh, the quote from the Onion uh, calling the uh, young black female actress actress a cunt. Uh, the quote was saying um, everyone is thinking it or wants to say it, and I'm wondering uh, what what have white people been been saying about this little girl. Uh, to make the onion say everyone's been thinking it or uh, wants to say it, and I'm wondering. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm I'm wondering. Um, just seeing seeing a couple of her interviews, very intelligent, and that in itself uh, 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 pisses white people off. Now, if it was a nine-year-old little white girl, who was very intelligent and spoke very well, and uh, you know. That's what they would say about her. She's very intelligent. She speaks very well. But when it's us, it it, it just it sends them into such a tizzy. You know, she's being uppity. Who does she think she is? And I and I really think that that may have been behind that comment. Well, I was thinking that it was when Gus said that in the movie that there was a white man in the movie and there might have been some some sexual connection between her and some white man did, 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 did didn't you didn't you say that Gus I did uh unfortunately that was what was reported mm. to me after I watched the film uh there really isn't it most of the film she's not with a white person most of the film she is with she's either by herself or in her pitiful situation with her attempted black male father uh, I don't know if I have the stomach to watch it a second time but I thought there was going to be like some blindside moment where uh, her dad is discarded her black uh, attempted father is discarded and the white people come in and take her uh, but that doesn't really it doesn't really go out the way that I thought it did so I would still say that I think the way that the the camera angles the way that uh, she shot uh, I think it is done in a sexualized way, uh, and I know I talked oh. to some other people who said the same thing. Um, but I just I wouldn't I would retract saying that there's a pedophilic relationship with her and a white man in the film because I after I actually sat and watched the whole thing I didn't really uh, see that I just felt what I saw when I initially watched the first 15 minutes that I felt like they were the way that they were shooting her the camera angles the images of how they were shooting her I felt was very sexualized. Um, mm. I would stick by that. I think that's I think that's pretty apparent. I would love to talk to some people who have more expertise around cinematography um, to see how they shoot females or how they shoot a scene or a person uh, if they want to sexualize them, how they shoot them, and then to see if they see any of those elements in Beasts of the Southern Wild. Um, I would also say that I saw, and this a listener pointed this out, and I have seen the article where they they were interviewing her and they titled the article Little Beasts and nobody mm. wigged out about that nobody got an attitude and said what are you doing calling her a beast was, oh this is great they're just you know playing on words in the title of the film but that's that's I suspect that is a part of what white people have been saying about her uh, privately uh, that the onion was mm. saying that they don't want to say uh, publicly uh, and just from the way the film you have to see the, if you've seen the film then you already know and I would say white people I'm sure they know her next film is going to be 12 years a slave and I can only conclude from what I know about that book uh, she's going to be one of the slaves that gets sold away from her parents and you'll have a nice scene where white people can see black families 
being destroyed and crying and all this. The same thing that we saw in our first mm-hmm. film uh, where black families get totally destroyed. So I suspect white people have all that in mind when they're making their little racist jokes and comments about mm-hmm. this little nine-year-old girl online or behind the scenes at work at the water cooler, whatever the case may be. And and she was six in the movie, I believe, five or six. Right. She was six, yeah. Right. She's nine now, but yeah. Either way, super inappropriate. And sexualized, mm-hmm. I would say the sexualized, just the fact that they called her a cunt, I would say that that is only uh, continuing the trend that I've seen with regards to them sexualizing this young girl, which is right in line with what we talked about today, Thomas Jefferson and mm-hmm. snatching 14-year-old slaves to rape. She's, you know, right mm-hmm. in the same boat. Uh, if, you, if anyone saw Beasts of the Southern Wild, we can talk about that on Saturday. Uh, if you think there was any sexualization of her going on in the film uh, I would love to hear feedback on that for any any folks out there who've seen uh, the film we can wrap on that this uh, this Saturday anywho we did our overtime she didn't and... hardly have any clothes on exactly exactly. exactly I mean she didn't have any clothes on she was scantily clad uh, for most of the film she yeah. had on like a very short pair of pants it almost looked like she had on a diaper like if you can imagine like a six year old yeah so she's six it almost looked mm-hmm. like she had on a diaper and like a halter top or a t-shirt and some boots that was like her garb yeah. her outfit for most of the film it wasn't like she was wearing a dress or jeans or pants uh, or anything like that it just looked like she had on almost mm-hmm. like a diaper uh, or some some pull-ups or something, uh, panties, what have you, uh, and a t-shirt. Like it just it felt very it felt very inappropriate, very uh, sexualized, and very on purpose. And it's very, in my view, it just confirms uh, that when they're calling her a cunt, it just confirms what I thought when I first saw the film uh, within the first fifteen minutes. Oh, but I could be wrong, you know. Now that you. Um- uh, Gus, I, I'm immediately thinking about the, the controversy when The Professional came out. Actually, that's one of my favorite movies, but the controversy that came out when they picked the girl, um, Natalie um, Portman, to play Matilda. Uh, there was a controversy about that. Um, they showed a different film in France versus when it first came to the U.S., because they, uh, they were saying that the movie had undertones of, uh, of the little girl Matilda being depicted in a sexual way in her relationship with Leon and stuff. Oh, it totally is. I've seen The Professional. It totally is. It's oh, like they're, yeah. in a, they're in a sexual relationship. It's, that you're saying that? Okay. Yeah. I haven't seen thing. it yet, but... It's the same, and even they mentioned uh, in that article that I read from the Guardian, where they were talking about the whole tweet and all that with the Onion, uh, and they they brought up the film Lolita, and the same theme is there too, uh, with an older white man and some young child. It's a book and a film, Lolita. Uh, I have seen yeah. the film. That pedophile element is there too. Uh, that's just you know that is a running theme uh, with white people, uh, rape of young children, constant. That's why I still I've been. I can't say I've been slacking, but I have wanted to write uh, a report on how I have no sympathy for the folks at Newton. Uh, white people do not care about children. Their whole history, mm-hmm. their whole behavior shows that. Uh, and I have no tears, no sympathy, no sorrow uh, for the white people at Newton. White people do not care about children uh, in any way, shape, form. Even white children, they don't care about. Uh, and all you have to do is read the newspaper every day to see who got raped or fondled or fed cookies with semen on them uh, yesterday, whatever part of the world, now whatever you want to mention white people do not care about children so you can check those out if you want to as well the lolita the pedophile theme is rampant in there i think it's a film called uh safe i don't remember the name but it's uh it is an actor he was in one of those films that was similar to the professional and lolita and it was the same thing where it was an older man with a young child she looked like she was maybe 11 or 12 and it was really sexualized i'll see if i can get that as we wrap the program up uh, again, I think the whole three hour thing is online. A woman called Moses. I think it's all on YouTube. You can see all three parts, all three hours of it. I think it's all together. And I think someone even put it as a playlist. So you don't have to do a lot of um, searching around. You can just load the playlist and you can see the see the whole thing. Uh, I'll I'll post the the playlist link. I'll put it on my Facebook page if folks want to um, check it out. Cicely Tyson, a woman called Moses, 1978. If you want to do some research. Uh, anywho, we will be back on uh, 
tomorrow. Uh, our sixth installment of uh, Warriors Don't Cry, Melba Patillo Beals, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, looking forward to uh, hearing more about what happened uh, with their whole experience being terrorized by uh, white children, racist children. Uh, we have the compensatory call in this weekend as well. Uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, hearing from folks dial in, share, get the update on everything we talked about today. And if anything has happened uh, in the meantime, uh, safe. That's the name of the film I was thinking of uh, with uh, Jason Stratum. Uh, he was in uh, Transporter, Snatch, uh, quite a few. The Expendables. He's been in a lot of films blowing up and killing people. But it's uh, him and this non-white so-called Asian, like 11 or 12 year old. And it's a very sexualized relationship. It's called uh, Safe. Came out in 2012. Anywho, Saturday, compensatory call in tomorrow, Friday, uh, Melba Patillo Beals, and we'll actually be on Sunday as well. Uh, black female. She has a lynch quilt project um, detailing the history of lynching in this area of the world. Black female will be great to have her on the program. If anybody has read Annette Gordon's read, Annette Gordon Reed's work, you can shoot me an email. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts uh, on that. If you think she's trying to make it seem as though this is not just rape uh, in the relationship with Sally Hemings and uh, Thomas Jefferson I'd be curious to hear that and I will be diligent see if we can uh, see if we can get her on the program anywho enjoyed it grand hearing from everybody thanks for all of the input uh, black again wanted to convey his thanks for uh, Bruce Vaughn for making it known uh, the uh, just the insanity and, and trifling antics uh, of the guest around his vernacular choice of words uh, around the uh, rape and terrorism that black people faced on the plantation from Jefferson at all. Uh, thank you all. I hope it was a constructive investment of your Thursday evening. Uh, we will be back soon. Replace white supremacy with justice as soon as possible. Uh, we ask the creator just to hone our ability to really be mindful of words, words that we are using, words that racists are using very important aspect in the war of racism white supremacy words have an immense impact on how we think how we behave how we function in the world huge impact most of the time we don't even think about the words that we're using what they mean the history of those words what ideas what concepts those words are connected to and uh, just as Bruce Fine and several of the other callers pointed out uh, we do not want to be referencing pedophiles and rapists as our long lost grandfathers long lost aunts uncles other foolishness uh, call things what they are matter of fact that would be a great way to end the program Randall Robinson it was a uh, Wonderful. I think I got that from Bruce Fine too. She told me uh, to check out Randall Robinson on Book TV when he was talking about a lot of his work. He was talking about the Haitian Revolution as well. Uh, but he had a quote. He said uh, in the interview it was from earlier this month. He said, "A Chinese proverb holds: it is the beginning of wisdom to call things by their right names." And I thought that was fantastic. Short one, but right to the point. The importance of being accurate with labels. And what we call things, that would be a huge quantum leap for black people, victims of racism, begin to call things by their correct name. We will be back tomorrow. Thank you all for tuning in. Context of White Supremacy, signing out. I'm a victim, brother. I'm a victim. I'm a victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned.